to <coughs> Chairman McHenry. Chairman Powell, welcome back. First, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Federal Reserve made the right decision to pause interest rate hikes. As you know, since last November, I've cautioned against any approach to monetary policy that ignores the Fed's maximum employment mandate and results in a recession with millions of people losing their homes and jobs. While we have had strong job growth thus far, experts contend that this trend will not persist with more rate hikes, especially in light of new challenges. For example, the recent bank failures have resulted in the banking industry further restricting credit, making it even more important for the Fed to move with caution. The progress that we have made in reducing inflation is borne out in the latest consumer price index data. In fact, it's been months, 10 months, since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, and inflation has successfully been cut in half. Every single Republican member of Congress voted against the bill and chose to cozy up to the wealthy tax cheats instead of working with Democrats to bring down costs for middle class families. However, the only way we will fully combat inflation is to address the primary driver of inflation, soaring housing costs. Congress must invest more in fair and affordable housing. Under President Biden, unemployment is also at a historic low and job growth is on the rise. So far, there's been 29 straight months of strong job growth. In fact, a record 13 million jobs have been created since President Biden took office. <clears throat> Democrats are working to build on this progress and grow the middle class so that everyone can share in this economic growth. Republicans, however, just can't seem to get their house in order on the heels of almost blowing up our economy by forcing a national default. They are now picking a fight over a tiny, tiny fee of less than 1% of total housing costs, ignoring the costs home buyers are paying with 7% interest rates, appraisal fees, and title insurance. Instead, they're fighting about gas stoves. In fact, just a week ago, Republican disarray got so bad that it halted business on the House floor for the first time in 20 years. Lastly, as we continue to monitor the banking system following the recent bank failures, the Fed must act to correct the supervisory and regulatory failures identified by our committee's oversight. Committee Democrats recently introduced 11 bills, including three of my own, to strengthen the safety and soundness of our banking system and hold executives accountable for their misdeeds. The Senate Banking Committee is holding a markup this morning on a bipartisan bill on bank executive accountability. So I urge Chair McHenry to join us in advancing sensible reforms to strengthen our nation's banking system. With that, I yield back. General Lee yields back. I now recognize the uh, Mr. Barr, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Financial Institutions Monetary Policy for one minute. We expect proposals from the Fed's Vice Chairman for Supervision that could increase capital for financial institutions as much as 20 percent. Our already well-capitalized banks withstood the COVID shock and severe Fed stress tests as the economy is facing headwinds from the Fed's own rapid rate hikes. Now is not the time to be engineering massive new regulatory changes or hindering regional banks, which have already been under stress. New onerous one-size-fits-all regulation by the Fed needs proper vetting and transparency. I would ask you today to commit to providing us with analysis done so far by the Fed on the Vice Chair's new proposals. I also respectfully ask that the Chairman revisit Section 1107A1 of the Dodd-Frank Act to observe that the Vice Chairman for Supervision is authorized only to develop recommendations for the Board and oversee supervision and regulation. The law does not give the Vice Chair special abilities to unilaterally, unilaterally write his own preferred regulations. It does not say that the Vice Chair should unilaterally write public-facing book reports on bank failures or results of climate scenario experiments. 
consensus as parents. Gentlemen, time is expired. We'll now recognize the subcommittee chair and financial institutions of monetary policy, Mr. Foster, for one minute. Thank you, Chair McHenry, and to Mr. Paul for being here today. In the wake of what seemed to be endless novel problems and disruption, I believe the Fed and Congress have done a reasonable job given the, the cards that we've been dealt. And indeed, it looks like the widely anticipated recession from the end game of COVID disruptions, if it occurs at all, will continue to be more of a soft landing than a disaster for our economy. Well, there's certainly more work to be done, but in the immediate term, we can reflect with satisfaction on the historically low unemployment, 11 straight months of slowing inflation since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. However, I recognize that the necessary monetary policies put forth to combat inflation have not been without stress, including on the fraction of our banks that chose to ignore the Fed's clear forward guidance on that interest rate hikes were in the pipeline. <clears throat> we on this committee, remain committed to alleviating the financial stress for everyday Americans to pay rent and get food on the table. I look forward to discussing how recent policies have performed and what else we should do going forward to ensure a strong economic rebound. Thank you, and I yield back. Today, we welcome the testimony of the Honorable Jerome H. Powell, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Chair Powell, we thank you for your time and being here. We'll, we'll recognize you for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your written testimony. Without objection, your written testimony will be made a part of the record. Chairman Powell, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Waters, and other members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. Chairman Powell, if you'll pull the mic closer. Uh, thanks. We at the Fed remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve, and without it, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. The U.S. economy slowed significantly last year, and recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a modest pace. Although growth in consumer spending has picked up this year, activity in the housing sector remains weak largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains very tight. Over the first five months of the year, job gains averaged a robust 314,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate moved up but remained low in May at 3.7%. There are some signs that supply and demand in the labor market are coming into better balance. The labor force participation rate has moved up in recent months, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54. Nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. While the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in April, total personal consumption expenditures prices rose 4.4%, excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 4.7%. In May, the 12-month change in the, in the CPI came in at 4.0%, and the change in the core CPI was 5.3%. Inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year. Nonetheless, inflation pressures continue to run high, and the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. With inflation running well above our longer-run goal of 2%, and with labor market conditions remaining tight, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. We've raised our policy interest rate by five percentage points since early last year and have continued to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk 
pace. We have been seeing the effects of our, monocy, of our policy tightening on demand in the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. The economy is facing headwinds from tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. And the extent of these effects remains uncertain. In light of how far we have come in tightening policy, the uncertain lags with which monetary policy affects the economy, and potential headwinds from credit tightening, the FOMC decided last week to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five to five and a quarter percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. Nearly all FOMC participants expect that it will be appropriate to raise interest rates somewhat further by the end of the year. But at last week's meeting, considering how far and how fast we've moved, we judged it prudent to hold the target range steady to allow the committee to assess additional information and its implications for monetary policy. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time, we will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity, inflation, and, and inflation economic and financial developments. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below-trend growth and some softening in labor market conditions. Restoring price stability, again, is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. Before concluding, let me briefly address the condition of the banking sector. The U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. As detailed in the box on financial stability in the monetary policy report, the Fed, together with the Treasury and the FDIC, took decisive action in March to protect the U.S. economy and to strengthen public confidence in our banking system. The recent bank failures, including that of Silicon Valley Bank and the resulting bank stress, have highlighted the importance of ensuring that we have the appropriate rules and supervisory practices for banks of this size. We are committed to addressing these vulnerabilities to make for a stronger and more resilient banking system. We understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Chairman Powell, uh, as I laid out in my opening statement, uh, inflation continues to be broad-based and persistent, both of which are concerning. Uh, last week, the Federal Open Markets Committee decided to pause um, rate increases. Um, and at the same time, the committee alluded that it would uh, raise rates more later in the year. Um, and so how should the FOMC's posture at the June meeting uh, be interpreted? Um, will, the, will the committee continue to raise rates later this year? W what's the thinking of this? What are we to understand? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So you're right, of course, we did decide to maintain the federal funds rate at its current rate at this meeting. At the same time, participants submitted uh, uh, personal forecasts suggesting that almost all of them thought there would be additional hikes. And I just want to say those two things are entirely consistent. Uh, the point being that the level to which we raise rates is actually a separate question of the speed with which we move. Earlier in the process, speed was very important. It's not very important now. The sense of the, of the summary of economic projections and the decision really is just that, given how far we've come, it may make sense to move rates higher, but to do so at a more moderate pace. That's really it. You know, we, we, we were at 75 basis points for several meetings. Then we were at 50 basis points, then 50 basis points, 25 basis points at, at three consecutive meetings, and now we're moderating that, that pace, much as you might do if you were to be driving you 75 miles an hour on the highway, then 50 miles an hour on a local highway, and then as you get closer to your destination, as you try to find that destination, you slow down even further. Okay. Uh, so it is uh, more data uh, is necessary for the Fed to make these decisions? 
Uh, and that's one interpretation, but thank you for, for a broader view there. Uh, I also want a broader view on, on this question of the vice chair for supervision uh, is performing his own personal holistic review of the Fed's regulatory framework for back, bank capital and liquidity. In an in a interview yesterday, he discussed some version of a new type of stress test even, uh, striking complete confusion in his description of it. Um, and at the same time, we have testimony from you, even from the vice chair of supervision, saying that we, are, we have a sound banking system that is well capitalized. Um, you will sit uh, in judgment of these, uh, this proposal that the vice chair for supervision will bring to the full board on this holistic review of capital. Uh, there are a lot of discussions about the, the amount of capital he's talking about. Uh, the concern that this is pro-cyclical at a time where our economy with higher rates is you're, you're measuring what's happening in the broader economy and at the same time we're going to have a, a, a major piece of capital put it, it required by financial institutions will, will, which will further restrict lending. Um, so how, how can, can you tell us to think about that given your seat at, on the Open Markets Committee and on, as a Fed governor? How would you interpret that? So I guess I would say um, you're right. There are a significant number of, of proposals that are kind of in the works. They haven't been finalized, let alone brought to the board yet. And so I, I can't really get into specific details today. Um, well, we'd like your thinking, Chairman Powell. I, I will, That's what we'd like. And I will, what I can share is you know principles and how I will think about this. Regulatory proposals, proposals go to the board. Every person on the board, that's six governors now, uh, you know, has an obligation to evaluate and vote on those, and I'm one of those people. I also chair the board. So a couple things I would point out. Just first that, um, you know, I think regulation should be transparent and consistent and not too volatile, uh, and uh, particularly as it relates to capital, uh, capital requirements. I, I do note the central importance of capital. We want banks to be resilient to shocks. We want them to be able to lend in good and bad times. Um, we want, in particular, the GSIBs, the eight largest banks, to have high levels, very high levels of capital and liquidity. Indeed, we spent years raising those levels uh, over a long period of time. And I think there's broad agreement, as you point out, that, that, that capital is, is strong. And, you know, the question there will be uh, what sorts of increases will be justified. That's what we'll be looking at. The other thing is to point out the trade-off between higher capital, you know, the benefit of it, of course, is to have stronger banks that can lend and maybe survive more, more kinds of crisis environments. But, you know, there are costs as well. There, and, and I think it's going to be, as always, a question of weighing and balancing those costs. And that's what I'll be thinking about. The last thing I'll say about that is just we benefit from having banks of all different shapes and sizes in our system. And we, we want to be careful not to regulate the smaller banks to the point where really their business models are challenged for all but the largest banks. Well, this committee would expect to see a quantitative analysis of whatever the, the capital uh, charge is going to be. Uh, we would expect that from the, the Fed, as we do from other regulators. Uh, with that, we'll now recognize the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Ms. Waters, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Chair Powell, at this committee's last hearing on digital assets, my Republican colleagues proposed a stable coin bill that would create 58 different licenses with federal regulatory approval over only two of the licenses. The remaining 56 licenses can be issued by each state, territory, and DC with little or no federal oversight, regulation, and enforcement. This proposal takes state preemption into a whole new level. It effectively allows every state to preempt, pre, preempt another state. DC-based coins, for example, would be sold to individuals nationwide, and New York or North Carolina regulators could do nothing to protect their own residents, while even the Fed would be severely hamstrung in providing any oversight. I've argued that we should allow states to be part of this process, but we must have a strong, enforceable federal floor with a role for the Federal Reserve to approve and provide oversight of payment, stablecoins issued by non-banks in order to ensure that consumers are protected. Such a framework is similar to our 
dual banking system, and it would ensure that non-banks and banks are treated the same. We should also bear in mind that payment stable coins are a new form of currency intended to allow individuals to pay for things with them. As such, do you agree that it is important for the Fed as our central bank to have a chance to approve or decline any state licensed non-bank entity before it starts issuing payment stable coins nationwide? Um, first of all, let me say we appreciate uh, that we've been able to offer our views on these things to your staff and also the majority staff, uh, and we appreciate the consideration that's given to our views. Um, we do see payment stable coins as a form of money, uh, and in all advanced economies, the ultimate source of credibility in money is the central bank, and we believe that uh, it would be appropriate to have a quite a robust federal role in, in what what, what happens in stable coins going forward and that leaving us with a weak role and allowing a lot of private money creation at the state level would be a mistake. But nonetheless, again, I do appreciate that we've, we've been able to be heard and, and share our views with, uh, with the committee. Well, thank you so very much. I am appreciative for that clear answer. The next question that I have for you is a bit unusual. Uh, but one of the reasons we push diversity is because those things that have not been discussed, uh, issues of people of color, et cetera, have not been dealt with. I'm going to throw you something that you would not expect. Earlier this week, our nation celebrated Juneteenth, which Congress recognized as a national holiday for the first time since 2021. The holiday celebrates the day enslaved African Americans in Texas heard that they were free two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued. To this day, black Americans grapple with enduring racial economic inequality that has its roots in slavery as evidenced by the black white gap in net worth and home ownership rates. My bill, the Federal Reserve Racial and Economic Equity Act would require the Federal Reserve to carry out its duties in a manner that supports the elimination of racial and ethnic disparities in employment, income, wealth, and access to affordable credit. Now, the Fed has a number of duties to pursue maximum employment in the monetary policy, to supervise banks for compliance with our fair lending laws, and to ensure the Community Reinvestment Act is administered in a way that puts an end to discriminatory redlining practices by banks. Do you agree with me? And Atlanta, Federal Reserve President, Raphael Bostic, among others, that the Fed has a role to play in addressing racial economic inequality as it carries out its work until Congress passes this bill. What steps will the Fed can you take to address racial and economic inequality? So we, um, we do consider inequality in the economy as part of our thinking about decisions, but ultimately, and, and those, are, those are certainly uh, um, highly valuable social goals to pursue. I would say our ability to, to uh, take part in addressing those issues is fairly limited. We have one federal interest rate that we set. We do try to keep in mind, as you know, uh, not just the aggregate national level of unemployment or employment, but also that for different uh, ethnic groups. So we take that into account, but I would think, and, and I think that's, that's just part of making sure that we feel like we have all Americans in the room with us when we're making decisions on monetary policy. I will say, though, I think other agencies are better suited to address these, uh, these deep issues. Thank you. We sh must have this continued discussion on racial equality. I yield back. The lady yields back. We'll now go to the vice chair, Mr. Hill of uh, Arkansas, for five minutes. I thank the uh, chairman of the committee. And Chairman Powell, great to have you back before the committee. And uh, this morning, you reiterated, and certainly Vice Chair Barr has reiterated a number of times that the banking industry here in the United States is well capitalized. And in fact, capital letter levels have remained robust despite COVID-19 with a 20% plus unemployment uh, rate increase and a 9% output gap. Uh, they've remained uh, stable through government shutdowns. They've remained stable through severe stress testing. And maybe more importantly, just in the last few months, since the first week of March, you've seen strong capital come into play as we've grappled with the reality of a 40-year increase in short-term interest rates and that, that uh, impact on banks. 
But as the chairman said, Michael Barr continues to say he wants to increase capital requirements on certain financial institutions. And in March, you testified uh, that you, you said, uh, I will do everything I can possibly do to bring people together, meaning on the Board of Governors, in consensus and have a capital framework that could be broadly supported. So to what extent have you and the other governors been involved in this so-called holistic review by Vice Chair Barr? Has he briefed the other, other members of the Board of Governors uh, thus far? Yes, and we, we've all been briefed by staff, really, on the proposals. But as I mentioned, they're still somewhat in, in motion. Uh, but yes, we've been briefed. So you would say those proposals are still under consideration and that there's no final decision that's been taken by the board? No, well, no. We, uh, once the proposals really do settle down and are written up, they'll come to the board for a full discussion and a vote. Has the Fed board reconstituted now the Committee on Supervision and Regulation? The membership yes. of it. And oh, who, who's on who's on that committee now? So that committee is chaired by by um, Vice Chair Barr, and it also includes uh, uh, Governor Jefferson, and it includes Governor Bowman. Uh, when you look at capital in the U.S., and I look at the uh, globally significant banks here versus other places in the world, would you say that the U.S. banks, the U.S. GSIBs, are better capitalized than their global peers in Europe or in Asia? So. We're certainly at or near the top of the league table. I think there are a couple other jurisdictions that also have broadly similar levels of capital strength. But yes, so we're at the top of the league table. I looked at it uh, this morning, and it, uh, U.S. GSIBs have 11.3% capital without any kind of modification compared to their European competitors at only 9.9%. So would you say that we're better capitalized than the European banks, the European GSIBs? I, I hate to uh, call out the other jurisdictions, but I would say our banks are very strongly capitalized and also competing quite successfully globally outside the United States. Yeah, I agree, and I think we've strengthened capital, we've strengthened our supervision, notwithstanding the uh, problems that we saw this spring, which we've talked about ad nauseum here, but that capital standard does make American banks, I think, stand out. And wouldn't Basel, the so-called Basel III holistic uh, reforms, wouldn't it be better if the European banks did a holistic review and actually got their capital up to American standards? <laughs> so I, I think they are, they are bound by the same, not, no one's bound by these, but they were, are, you know, have agreed to follow the same standards, and I think they're going yeah. through the same process we're going through. Uh, same topic, are the uh, FDIC supervisory process and the OCC supervisors, are they involved and engaged with Vice Chair Barr in looking at this, quote, holistic review of capital adequacy? I think in other words, are, is, are they providing their input uh, to the Vice Chair for supervision in their own views on this topic? On, re on the regulatory proposals that, that are relevant to them, yes. I think on the capital proposals, yes, I believe so. And you made a comment a minute ago, I think, to uh, Chairman McHenry's questions about that you'd like to see rules and supervisor rules consistent over time. And I think that's frustrating here. We see change in administration. Sometimes we see change in rules, which is, I think, frustrating to the private sector and to market participants. I note that uh, the Biden administration says that the Financial Stability Oversight Board should now base their decisions on size as opposed to activities. And for several years now, we've had an activities designation and a cost benefit analysis. Do you think the activities designation is, gives supervisors more discretion at FSOC to select who should be deemed uh, under their supervision? So I actually think that one, one. In other words, is size alone, should we be looking only at size or should we look at cost benefit analysis and activities? And my time's expired. If you'd, you'd answer in writing, Okay. I would appreciate it. I think this is an important issue. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. We'll now go to uh, Ms. Velasquez of New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair Powell, at your press conference last week, you stated, and I quote, the committee is completely unified in the need to get inflation down to 2% and will do whatever it takes to get it down to 2% over time. Some analysts have interpreted this statement as the FOMC's willingness to trigger a recession in order to get inflation to 2%. How would you respond if this is a fair and accurate interpretation? 
our statutory goals are price stability and maximum employment, and we are dedicated to using our tools to achieving those. In the case of uh, employment, we still have historically low unemployment rates and high employment rates now, high participation, a very strong labor market. We're very far from our, our uh, inflation target of 2%, and we're very focused on getting back to 2%. And how does the FOMC takes into consideration the impact of rising interest rates on LMI communities and small businesses when determining monetary policies? So our, we only have one interest rate to raise or lower. It's not true, but mainly one main interest rate to raise or lower, and it applies to everyone. But I would say that inflation hits LMI communities and people generally um, at the lower end of the income spectrum much harder than, than people in the middle or at the high end because high inflation you're, uh, can get you into trouble right away if you're living on a fixed income just to cover the basic necessities. So it is for the benefit of those people that we must get inflation under control. It's better for the benefit of all Americans, but particularly for those people. And we keep that in mind as we are strongly committed to getting inflation back down to 2% over time. Well, and they, they, they are the same people that are having a hard time accessing loans. The same with small businesses. Uh, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Barr's uh, report on the Fed's review of Silicon Valley Bank states that while there was regulatory tailoring conducted in response to S2155, there was also, and this is the part that really concerns me, a cultural shift at the Fed under the direction of the previous vice chair for supervision, Randy Quirles. According to the report, this shift included pressure to reduce burdens on firms, meet a higher burden of proof for a supervisory conclusion, and a need to accumulate more evidence than in the past. As chair, during that period, were you aware of this culture of shift and the impact it was creating? So I, I think we learned from the uh, Silicon Valley failure and the others that there is going to be a need for stronger supervision and also regulation for banks of that size. And I'm committed to learning the right lessons from this exercise and to forthrightly implementing but, uh, changes. Uh, were you aware of the cultural shift? So I, I, I can't really uh, characterize it that way. Certainly, I was aware that we were trying to avoid excessive regulatory burden. That so do you disagree with thing. Chair Barr's report in that respect? I, I, I'm sure that the people who wrote the report were accurately reporting what they, what they heard from back how, in the day. How often were you meeting with Vice Chair Quirrells? You know, I, I reasonably frequently, we, you know, we sat quite near each other. And uh, never discussed the culture of shift. I, I, I didn't say that. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't remember it. The way you're describing it is not what I recall. I recall Vice Chair uh, Quarles talking about uh, things like focusing on the really important issues and not getting diverted into other. So the, the way it was described by Vice Chair Barr is not what you recall. Well, so what I had no steps part in, I, I said, I had no part in preparing the report. I'm, I'm confident that the people, that the staff who worked on the report reported accurately what they heard. I'm, I'm sure that that's right. So what steps did you take proactively to meet with regulatory and supervisory staff? Well, I think we're taking significant steps now. We're, you know, we're, as you know, under Vice Chair Barr's leadership, we're looking carefully at these events and asking ourselves, what do we need to do for with supervision? And I, you know, I think there is a, a point to be made that um, there are situations in which we need to more be more forceful and more proactive, not in all situations, but in some. In regulation, I think we're learning that uh, we need to update our thinking around liquidity regulation, which was based on a certain speed of bank runs, which now looks to be uh, outdated. My time has expired. The gentlelady's time has expired. We'll now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Garbarino, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. I just want to start off by asking a few yes or no questions. Was the Silicon Valley bank failure a result of a liquidity issue? 
I'm sorry. Was so, Silicon Valley Bank failure a result of the liquidity issue? Among other things, yes. yes. <laughs> Signature bank failure, uh, the result of a liquidity issue? Yes, I mean, that's not, there's also a lot of very bad management decisions in, being made here. Yeah. But liquidity. Yeah. Uh, First Republic, was that a failure result of a liquidity issue also? Among other things, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say just, just liquidity. Well, all right, would, were any of them a failure of having too low capital levels? So well, let's go to Silicon Valley Bank. You know, um, the, the issue that triggered the run initially was the, 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 um, the presence of significant losses in their uh, securities portfolio. Yes. And, that's, and, and that, is in a, that's, you know, that is a capital issue. So because so they, they had too low a capital, the requirements. So, so they, what they weren't required to, as you know, they weren't required to take that into account in their in their capital. But I think the, if you remember that what people were focusing on was these portfolio losses, and then what what people weren't focusing on was the fact that they had in excess of ninety percent uninsured deposits, what, and that's what caused the run. So, would increasing capital requirements for Silicon Valley Bank or any of these other banks or all banks together would that have stopped these banks from failing? That's a that's an un, you know that's a hypothetical unknowable question. I think it might have helped. I think I think it might have helped. But um, uh, how much then increasing it by how much would have helped? I, I it's very hard to say. Very hard to say. I mean, clearly the, the main issue there was a, a failure of management to follow up, a failure of supervision to require them to follow up, and you know really the liquidity regulation was just not it was not appropriate. We needed to have stronger regulation around liquidity and uninsured deposits. Last year, you said the banking system is very strong, well capitalized, high, highly liquid, does a much better job of understanding the risks that it runs and managing them. And just today, you said the banking uh, sector seems to be strong. Uh, do you still stand by those statements? I mean, you just said it today. Yes. So, yep. Last last month, Vice Chair Barr appeared before this committee, and, and he agreed with you and said overall banks have a strong capital and liquidity. Secretary Yellen has said similar uh, similar things. But today, you you know. Even though you've all said that banks seem to have strong capital, you seem to lead us today by saying you're, the bank's considering what increase would be appropriate of capital requirements. So has the board already decided that an increase will happen? They're just deciding what, what's the size of the increase for capital no, requirements? No, what I, what I meant to say, what I, what I thought I said was uh, that, that any, any increase above these levels would need to be shown to be justified. So I understand. <clears throat> And, and you have a vote as whether or not what this proposal, you'll, you'll, you'll vote on whether or not, do you personally think that an increase is necessary at this time? Do I think? That a, an increase in capital requirements is necessary at this time. Look, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna react to whatever the proposal turns out to be in the end and give it my best assessment. And, and also, I'll, you know, one, that, that's what I'll say. That's what I'll say. Okay. You just also say that credit is tightening, won't increasing Capital requirements further tighten credit? Over time, I mean, the thing about capital requirements is if, you, if we put a proposal out this summer, let's say, it'll be quite a while before that proposal is, you know, agreed in, among the agencies and then voted on, and then, then it will be, it'll take some years to come into full effect. So I, I would think, whereas, whereas interest rates, for example, have immediate effects mm -hmm. on financial conditions and then reasonably quick effects on economic activity, Capital requirements are, are a much more sort of medium term, longer term thing. So I just want to, I'd like to move on to what the impacts on lending, raising capital requirements would have. According to an academic literature by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, supervision a 1% point increase in capital requirements could potentially reduce annual GDP by up to 16 basis points, showing that higher capital requirements come at a cost and could have significant impact on the US economy. I discussed this with Vice Chair Barr last month, and he and expressed my concerns about what the impact of increased capital on the real economy, but he didn't answer the question uh, directly. We just need to, we're hearing from all sorts of industry that these increased capital requirements at any level would have a further tightening on lending. And if that happens, and I'm hearing from everybody, if that happens, we're, we're, it's, it's gonna be a real disaster. So we, I think anything that uh, the, the committee proposes, if you could come back and brief us on before it's finalized, uh, we would appreciate that very much, sir. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is now recognized.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. This is probably Economics 101, but um, a lot of people in my district are uh, misunderstanding uh, 101 along with me. Uh, in May uh, of, of this year, unemployment uh, remained at 4% uh, for the 16th uh, consecutive month um, and, and at 3.7%. Uh, uh, this, this means that unemployment remained at or below 4% for the longest stretch in 50 years. Um, in, in the U.S., the, the job openings rate has fallen uh, by more than 1.5 percentage points from its peak, while the unemployment rate uh, has crept slightly lower. Um, in other words, the job openings decline, but so does joblessness. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if there was any expectation that this would, have, would, this would occur. There is an expectation that the, the level of the ratio of job openings to unemployed people has been at in historic territory, all-time highs for a while now, in the last year or so. And there is an expectation that it will come down. There, there a while ago, there, was, there were two jobs for every unemployed person. Now we're down to 1.7, I believe, or 1.6. And that still speaks to a historically tight labor market, where their demand for labor still very substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. So we do expect as, uh -huh. as things, and that, by the way, that's a way, that's a way that the labor market can become less tight without having unemployment go up. Uh, uh, I'm sure you, you're hearing, uh, hearing this all over uh, as, as I am, and that is um, uh, business people. Um, I've got a fr good friend who was, um, number of barbecue restaurants in Kansas City. Uh, and he is uh, constantly uh, telling me how difficult it is to find workers uh, to the point where he, he did something he thought I'd never do, put a sign out in front of his restaurants, you know, uh, job openings. And um, I, I, are there particular uh, uh, ind industries uh, or sectors of the economy where we would expect this sentiment to be particularly true. No, and that is right. That is, um, uh, there's still a significant labor shortage. I, you know, the surveys at the aggregate level show that it's not as bad as it was two years ago. So gradually, uh, businesses are reporting that, that they're having a you know, more, better able to find workers. Workers are reporting that they're, they're not quitting their jobs as much as they were. That's a really good sign of how tight a labor market is, is how much people are, feel free to quit their jobs voluntarily. So those things are all suggesting a gradual cooling and a gradual, gradually getting supply and demand back into, into alignment, but it's, we're not there yet. We still have a significant uh, excess uh, of demand over supply. Uh, are we also finding that, that you know, in, in, well, I know in Missouri, that in, in spite of the fact that there is some uh, you know, jelly-like movement with the economy, uh, people are still willing to go, in, in, in our community, still willing to go out and, and buy homes. I mean, um, we're, not, we're not having difficulty in, ter in terms of people going out getting uh, loans, even with the interest rates rising. Um, if, that con if, if all of this continues, if, if the, if the, the uh, consumers are, are constantly paying whatever the interest rates uh, uh, might be, uh, are we going to get stuck uh, just continually going up? Well, no, I don't think so. Um, so in, ha in housing in particular, um, there is a uh, the housing sector nationally has flattened out and maybe ticked up a little bit, but at a much lower level from where it was with rates as high as they are. So supply and demand there are getting back into, into uh, alignment. And I, I do think that, you know, housing inflation uh, uh, is is set to come down as we as we move forward. Um, there, there's a particular way that that the inflation is calculated there, so that you're really only looking at at the the 
you're waiting for leases to, to come due and roll over at much lower levels of increase. So we think housing inflation will be coming down significantly over the course of the rest of this year and next year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Kim, is recognized. Thank you for recognizing me, Chairman. Um, and Chairman Powell, thank you for joining us. I appreciate your comment uh, to price stability and commend your efforts to reduce inflation and make life more affordable for all Americans. Thank you for that. The uh, 10,000 small businesses survey of 2,000 small businesses found that 77% were concerned about their ability to access capital. So with that in mind, uh, do you think it's appropriate for the Federal Reserve to increase capital requirements at this time? And I know this was discussed earlier, but what specific analysis has the Fed conducted so uh, we can determine the impact of this warrantless regulatory action on small businesses and other marginal borrowers? So it's, with capital standards, it's always a trade-off. The more capital means a more stable, more sound, more resilient banking system, but it also at the margin can mean uh, a, a little bit less credit availability and also the price of credit can be affected. And there's no perfect way to assess that balance. Uh, obviously, the answer is not zero capital, and it's not 100% capital, so it's somewhere in the yeah. middle. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are estimated about uh, 1.5 trillion of commercial real estate loans that are maturing in the next three years. And declining demand and the prevalence of work from home policies are putting a strain on commercial real estate market. The bulk of commercial real estate loans are held by smaller and regional banks. So is the Fed thinking about policies that could provide time for commercial real estate loans to be refinanced? And could an increase in capital requirements reduce liquidity, uh, liquidity in the commercial real estate loan market? We're, we're very focused on the uh, commercial real estate situation. You're right, of course, that a good portion of the commercial real estate loans are held in, in smaller banks. Um, and supervisors are very much engaged with those banks. And it's, it's particularly banks that have a high concentration. That's what we look for among the smaller banks. And there, there are some of those. But there's a playbook for working your way, you know, for, for um, you know, working your way out of these loans. And it's particularly in the office sector where, you know, work from home is still a pretty material yeah. factor in, in some areas, as you know. Thank you. You know, um, so the next question has to do with the, the board process and procedures. Um, what are those um, procedures that govern consideration and potential adaption of matters, like the proposals that Vice Chair Barr uh, is um, you know about to present to the board. So on, on regulation, as opposed to supervision, on regulation, uh, the Board of Governors votes on regulatory proposals, and it's a majority vote. We now have six voters, so when there is a proposal, it will be briefed carefully, and then we will have uh, uh, we'll have a meeting, or or it can be done actually virtually, and and probably will be that way, uh, as most of our meetings are, and then we have a vote. Mm -hmm. That's on supervision, it's different. Most supervisory matters are really under the authority of the vice chair for supervision under the law. So mm -hmm. most of them don't have to go to the board for a vote. So what percentage of the governors must vote um, in favor? Majority. The majority of them? OK. Yeah. Um, the California governor, prior to the depositor bailout for SVB, reportedly identified that he had been in touch with the highest levels of leadership at the White House and the Treasury. The governor also on Sunday, March 12, when the bailout was announced, uh, issued his own statement praising that action. There have also been reports that the governor and his wife, with respect to their business and perhaps other interests, ha may have had depositor interest in SVB. So when the reserve Federal uh, Reserve Board, the FDIC Board, and Secretary Yellen, in consultation with the President, recommended invoking the systemic risk exception for SVB, and then decided to provide blanket insurance even on uninsured balances. Did the Fed or any others, to your knowledge, perform any conflict of interest due diligence? No, I mean, you know, we were in an emergency situation on Monday morning. There was going to be, and there was a run on uh, on banks that looked, you know, that so had looking back, do you think there was so we, any? We, 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 we carried out our yeah. duties, and I'm I'm actually 
pretty, pretty sure we did the right thing. And you don't think there was any conflict of interest, even looking I back? I have nothing. I have absolutely no knowledge on that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for being here. I yield back the balance of my time. General Eddie yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for being here with us this morning. The June Federal Open Market Committee uh, report indicates inflation in the U.S. and abroad continue to ease but remain elevated. Uh, in response to the FOMC um, that has the proposed interest rate increases up until June 14th recommendations to pause interest rate hikes for the first time this year, research has shown that the effects of monetary policy decisions like raising interest rates uh, can take on average 42 months to be realized fully in the United States meaning we may not fully understand the effects of this first increase uh, in rates of uh, March, 20, uh, March 2022 until next fall. With that in mind, uh, how have our recent tightened monetary policies impacted the strength of the U.S. dollar and how it is val valued globally? Let me, let me say that there's a lot of uncertainty around how long it takes monetary policy to affect real activity. There's no agreement on 42 months or any particular thing, and I think most, most people would say shorter than that. So you're asking how it would affect the dollar? Yes. So the, um, first of all, the, the, the Treasury Department has responsibility for the level of the dollar that, and the stewardship of the dollar as a currency. We don't, we don't actually comment on that. We don't, we don't look at any particular level. It's just another, to us, it's a, it's a financial condition. A stronger dollar means certain things, and a weaker dollar means certain other things. But it continues to be a concern here in this committee. Also, Chairman, as you're aware, the Federal Reserve's core mission is to keep employment up and inflation down. Although I understand the calls for climate-related financial risk management from my colleagues, uh, we should be focusing on the economic state of our country. The credit of the U.S. dollar is at jeopardy, and, and as you know, there, we've had global pressure recently, and we need to be sending a clear message that the world can rely on the full faith and credit of the United States dollar. We should be focusing on mitigating the calls to reduce dependency of the U.S. dollar. Monetary policy changes implemented in the U.S. are likely to cause a ripple effect throughout the global economy. With that said, would you agree that monetary policies uh, to directly address climate change should be made by Congress and not the Federal Reserve, and implementing monetary policies and supervisory tools to exclude energy leaders uh, from capital and financial institutions would have a grave impact on local, state, federal, and even global economies? A strong agreement around the fact that we have a, quite a narrow role in climate change, and really the important decisions about climate change need to be made by elected people, not by the Fed. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for being here. Really appreciate you being here. Um, <clears throat> look, I got to say, first of all, it was good to hear from the other side of the aisle that the Federal Reserve should not even be engaging in using its tools with respect to climate change or climate mitigation or whatever the case might be. Um, the Fed, you guys have a big enough job as is. Adding anything like that to your job, I think, will be a will be wholly detrimental to the American economy. So, I for one this morning am glad to hear that coming from the other side of the aisle. Uh, you've had a couple questions already on 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 capital, bank capital, etc. Um, look, some of the some of the current views are that raising bank continuous raises of bank capital will increase uh, costs to our economy anywhere from fifty to two hundred billion dollars. Uh, what's your view of, of the current desire or mode of, of Vice Chair Barr to uh, fully implement the Basel III capital standards? Well, I, I think that's, uh, that's the next thing. Uh, Vice Chair Quarles was working on that. It didn't, it didn't get completed uh, for various reasons, but that, you know, I think that's, a, that's a, an international capital standard that we should go ahead and complete. As to the level of the right level of capital, that's a dis that's a discussion we're about to have. Um, are you guys at the Fed? Are you guys kind of concerned about the fact that now it seems like you know the European regulators are starting to pull back from that? Like they're starting to think about capital standards being too much for European banks, and that they're starting to receive from from what was, I assume, uh, you know, kind of a handshake agreement in years gone by. Yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not hearing that exactly. We'll be watching that carefully, though. Okay. Um, overall, just with respect to capital, I mean, let's take a step back. 
obviously since 2008, 2009, uh, we have, in my view, aggressively gone through this process of increasing capital standards and capital requirements on a tier one capital for banks. In retrospect, do you think that's been a net positive to the overall banking environment, or do you believe it's been a, a negative to the overall banking environment? I think it's been a, a, a net positive, and I, as I pointed out earlier, U.S. banks have competed very, very successfully through this period, despite despite what were pretty significant capital increases that we put in a few years back. So it, it really has led to a very strong, and also made it well through the pandemic period, uh, I thought, and I think that was a pretty good test. So even though the government did do a lot to support uh, to support the economy, still I think that those capital hikes that we made in the in the last cycle uh, come through looking pretty good. Do, do you guys at the Fed, do you have a view of, I say you guys, because I know you're the chairman, but there's other members as well. Um, do you have a view of the concern about uh, community banking in the United States or a lack thereof of community banking? It has been shrinking quite significantly over the past you know, 10 to 12 years. Very very much so. It's a focus for us. You know, we, uh, we understand the importance of community banks that you know, the, they provide a different service and a, and a really important service to smaller businesses and communities. And um, community banks have been consolidating for 30 years now. So it's, a, it's really a secular trend as people have moved to bigger cities and things like that. But we don't want to do anything to, to move that along. We think that you know, the world's not a better place with fewer community banks. And we try to, we try to keep that in mind in all of the regulatory and supervisory things that we, that we do. Do you, do you think that uh, federal regulatory policy, in part from Congress, um, has led to a supercharging effect of diminished community banking in the United States? It's probably been a factor, but I do think there have been important demographic factors as well. Uh, and also uh, having interstate banking, interstate banking only became you know, legal quite recently, and that also has led to consolidation. You can look back though, uh, again, look back 30 plus years, and you've seen a very steady decline. So I think there are, there are demographic and other factors driving it, but uh, you know, Regulation can fall as a fixed cost, which means that institutions need to be bigger. And I think that's probably part of the story. Uh, look, I, I don't disagree with your conclusion. I'm just concerned about the trajectory. I think just having larger financial institutions, larger banks overall, with a diminishing smaller community bank uh, infrastructure is detrimental to lending to small businesses, mom and pop businesses. Um, it also could be parochial. I, I got I started my career in community banking, so you know I, I saw a heartfelt situation. Last question, running out of time. Uh, the SEC has proposed a rule that would, among other things, require banks to segregate client cash held in custody, upending uh, custody bank bank custody bank balance sheets, and by extension, the bank custody mo uh, model. Are you guys at the Fed concerned about this proposed rule from the SEC? The, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the I'll, chairman can I'll respond to in that. writing. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, gentleman's, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is now recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, as you know, the U.S. has foreign adversaries, particularly the CCP, that seem intent on de-dollarization. How seriously should the threat of de-dollarization be taken, in your view? Well, the the status of the United States of the dollar as the world's reserve currency is a very important thing to us. I think uh, the reason we have that status is largely due to our great democratic institutions, the rule of law, and the fact that we, we have, um, generally speaking, had, had strong levels of price stability. And I think that the dollar will remain the, the reserve currency as long as those things are in place. Well, I want to explore that, that answer because commentators often speak of the dollar is the world's reserve currency as the cause of America's economic dominance. Do you think of it as the cause of America's economic dominance or as a consequence of it? It's, to me, it's more of a, of a consequence. And also, it just there, there tends to be an equilibrium where one currency becomes the, the accepted global standard, and that has been the dollar for some time, and I expect that it will be for some time, continue to be. Uh, it's often said that the Fed has a dual mandate of maximum employment and price stability. Do you view these mandates as equally binding upon the Fed, or does one supersede the other? They are perfectly equal under the law. And I'm curious to know what it means in practice to have a 2% inflation target. Uh, the latest pause notwithstanding, does it mean the Federal Reserve will continue raising interest rates until the 2% target is reached, 
even if doing so comes at the expense of maximum employment as well as financial stability? No, it doesn't mean that. It does not. So the way we think about it is um, most of the time the, the two goals are aligned in the sense that if you're, if you're achieving one, you're achieving the other, and if, if you're a little bit off, the, the other one, they move in the same direction. Today's situation is unusual in that we are overachieving, in effect, the maximum employment goal, but we are far from achieving the, the uh, inflation goal. So in our system, we have a constitutional document, and what it says is, is that when, when that's the case, you look at how far you are from the goal, and you look at the speed with which you would move back to the goal. And so that would tell you today that we, we should focus heavily on inflation, but as, as it becomes closer, as, as, you know, as, as the two things become more aligned, then, then they go back into perfect equality under the law. So the Fed engages in a delicate balancing act between employment and inflation. Yes. To what extent do you, do you factor in financial stability, safety, and soundness when raising interest rates? So we, you're right. We do have a, a financial stability um, mandate, but we, we try to we try to. Do well, you have a financial stability mandate with respect to your role as a bank regulator. But when but it also, comes to also just generally, we're the okay. lender of last resort. Central banks were originally created to to support the financial system in times of stress and to make sure that you don't get into times of stress. So, I would say that. Um, uh, sorry, what, what was your question before that? It was uh, to what extent do you factor in safety and soundness when setting so interest we, rates? Sorry, so we um, we really try hard to use our financial stability tools for financial stability purposes and our monetary policy tools for monetary purposes. The the, the reality on the ground is much messier than that. They're very much entangled, uh, and one affects the other. So the separation is not is not at all perfect. But we do think of these as separate separate things with separate tools. Do, do you think that the Silicon Valley bank failure revealed a deeper tension between the safety and soundness mandate of the Fed as a bank regulator and the, and the, um, uh, fin the, infl and the mandate of the Fed as an administrator of, of monetary policy? Or I would say no, and I'll tell you why. Um, interest rate risk is you know, one of the most basic banking risks we supervise for it. Um, overwhelmingly, U.S. banks did manage their interest rate risk. Silicon Valley Bank didn't, and even though we were, you know, the uh, supervisors were were pointing that out to them, they just didn't take, you know, the bank didn't take uh, action quickly enough. So I, I would have thought that you can say that it was interest rate uh, hikes that caused portfolio losses, but it was management that failed to hedge against those losses and failed to hold appropriate liquidity. Uh, in the pre-COVID world, we had the best of both worlds, low unemployment, low inflation for decades. Do you believe that we could return to that best of both worlds or are high interest rates a new normal in the American economy? So we will return to 2% inflation and, and maximum employment. Um, what will be the level of interest rates there? That's, that's a really good question. And uh, Do you suspect it's going to settle at a higher level than we've known historically? I think it's really hard to know. You know it's yeah. a great question. We talk about this a lot. You, the people who argue that, it, that they will move it back down just point to the fact that it was really global factors that drove rates down in the first place. Maybe the truth is somewhere in the middle. The gentleman's time has expired. Know. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Flood, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell. I'd like to discuss the continued efforts to unwind years and years of quantitative easing and what it's done to our Federal Reserve balance sheet. If you take a look at the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet since the 2008 financial crisis, we've seen an alarming increase from around 800 million to today's 8.3 trillion in assets. Back in 2018, you did start the work of winding down the balance sheet. You managed to offload roughly 700 billion assets between the beginning of your time as Federal Reserve Chair and August of 2019. The problem was shortly after your efforts began, we had another major economic shock, the COVID-19 pandemic that caused the Fed to once again return to quantitative easing as a form of economic relief. Pretty soon, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet had increased another four trillion dollars in size. That's how we made it to the balance sheet level that we are at today. I understand you've started working to shed some of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, and I appreciate the work. That being said, the scale involved here, to me, is startling. My concern, Chairman Powell, is that efforts to shed assets from the Fed's balance sheet have never been anywhere as quick as efforts to build it back up. 
our economic cycle does go through recessions from time to time. It's not always boom, but some bust too. If we continue a pattern of rapidly building up the Federal Reserve's balance sheet in bad times and slowly shedding assets in good times, we're going to see the balance sheet grow significantly over time. Chairman Powell, is this a concern of yours? And to pair with that question, long term, how can we avoid an environment where any effort to unwind the Federal Reserve's balance sheet is undone anytime there's an economic shock? It is a concern, and uh, that's why we are uh, this this um, this time the balance sheet roll off is is much much faster than it was back in the in the first episode. We also know more. We hadn't we hadn't grown our balance sheet like that, and we hadn't shrunk it before. Now we have experience with that. So we are we are moving back down to a level that will be appropriate for our new framework. By the way, we won't go back to a framework where we were dealing with scarce reserves. We we like the administrative uh, rate uh, framework that we're in now. But it is important that the that the balance sheet not just grow with every cycle, and I think I'm, I'm very conscious of that. Chairman Powell, do you have an optimal Fed target for the size of what the balance sheet should look like, uh, you know, a number? You know, I, I'll give you the, the idea, and that is, it's, you find the number, but the, the idea is that it, it, it's smaller than now. Uh, it's, a, it's a place where reserves are abundant, and also, have a little bit of a buffer on top of that so that we don't accidentally run into reserve scarcity. Demand for reserves can be volatile, and you don't want to find yourself, as we did a few years back, suddenly finding um, that, that reserves were scarce, even though we, and we didn't see it coming, and we, had to, we then had to you know, put more reserves into the system at a time uh, when we didn't want to be doing that. So I think you want to have levels, a level of, uh, where we have ample reserves plus a buffer, and you know that'll be a percent of GDP that we get down to, and you know we're moving in that direction pretty pretty smartly. Chairman Powell, realistically, how quickly can the Federal Reserve unwind its balance sheet? What's the threshold beyond which an asset sell-off by the Federal Reserve would disrupt our markets? So we we don't sell assets. What we do is we allow them to mature and passively roll off, and that's what we're doing to the tune of about a trillion dollars a year. And we're in the middle of that process now. We will. As a, it, it's an empirical question. You're going to find a level that is still ample, uh, plus plus a bit of a buffer, and that's that's how we're thinking about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just reiterate my concern on this issue. I fear that having the Federal Reserve uh, backstop so much of our economy through the holding of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities is not sustainable long term. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I yield back. <clears throat> gentleman yields. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Horsford or Nevada, uh, Mr. Horsford is recognized. Thank the chair and the ranking member for holding this important hearing, and thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for appearing before the committee today. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to ask uh, permission to enter into the record uh, editorial by the Las Vegas Sun entitled, Economy Infrastructure Thrive When Dims Have the Rains, dated February, June 16, 2023. Without objection. During this time of increased economic uncertainty, it is more important than ever that the Federal Reserve fulfills its dual mission of maximizing employment and supporting price stability. There is no doubt that it is difficult uh, and the needle that has to be thread uh, is very uh, specific. However, the human cost is simply too great for us to get this wrong. Sometimes we need to be reminded that there are real people behind the economic data and that the actions taken by both Congress and the Fed have real consequences for everyday Americans. Everyday Americans who want to know that myself and my colleagues are dedicated to creating an economy that actually works for them, which is why I was pleased that last week the Federal Reserve decided to pause your interest rate hikes and take stock of the overall economic picture. Now, don't get me wrong, there's certainly more work ahead of us but with 13 million jobs added since President Biden took office, uh, we should be rooting for America to succeed and not to fail. The strength of the labor market continues despite the multiple concurrent shocks that continue to reverberate throughout the global economy. And I believe our economy remains resilient thanks the, to the historic investments that were included in the legislation passed last Congress and signed into law by President Biden. These beneficiaries of these investments were the people, the middle class, not special interest. 
The bipartisan infrastructure law is creating construction jobs and projects that will help ease supply chain challenges and ensure safer transportation for everyone. President Biden and congressional Democrats are investing in technology that will define the 21st century, components to generate solar and wind energy, semiconductors and electric vehicles that will all be made here in America. Just last week, Treasury Secretary Yellen was before this committee and described how the transformational investments from the Inflation Reduction Act are ushering in a renaissance of domestic manufacturing. These are good paying jobs, union jobs, that are expanding our production capacity here at home while reducing our reliance on goods imported from abroad. As I indicated in the editorial by my hometown newspaper, the Las Vegas Sun, remarks that annual investments in manufacturing construction has more than doubled its pre-pandemic levels. Furthermore, when we narrow the focus to the region, including Nevada, the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that in just two years, private manufacturing construction increased almost tenfold. So if we want to rebuild the American middle class, we must do so from the middle out and by investing in modern infrastructure and modern manufacturing facilities. But this does not mean that everything is improving equally. I've heard time and again from my constituents about the cost of housing being one of their biggest pain points. The Monetary Policy Report points out that housing services prices have risen a shocking 8.5% over the 12-month period ending in April, and in my district, it's even worse. So Chair Powell, at a time where it has become increasingly difficult for working Nevadans to purchase a home, I worry that rising mortgage rates will put working families even further behind on accessing the wealth and equity that a house provides. While higher rates have cooled some housing markets across the country, what do you see as the biggest remaining upward pressure on housing services, and what can we do in Congress to incentivize new home starts to hopefully moderate the imbalance between supply and demand in the housing market. I think you're talking about longer run, largely longer run uh, factors here. And uh, I think there, there has been for some time a shortage of housing. Uh, uh, it's harder to get lots, it's harder to get workers, and, and in the pandemic it, it had been harder to get materials and things like that. So there's certainly a need for, for more housing. I think during, during the pandemic you had people wanting to live in houses rather than downtown in, in apartments because of COVID. You had low rates, and so you had two or three years of very, very high uh, rating, price increases for housing, and now that is flattened out a lot as we've raised rates. And uh, Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, you, the Fed's Vice Chairman for Supervision, and many others have indicated that the banking system is well capitalized. Uh, bank capitalization remained robust during the COVID shock and related shutdowns of economic activity and in severe Fed testing, stress testing. Nonetheless, the Vice Chair for Supervision wants to increase capital and other requirements on financial institutions. This will have substantial economic effects that will begin immediately while you are still focusing on bringing inflation back to the Fed's 2% target. Excessively high capital requirements will constrain credit provision to the economy, costing jobs, incomes, opportunities, and living standards. As my colleague, Mr. Garbarino, pointed out, a 1% increase in capital requirements could potentially reduce GDP by up to 16 basis points uh, based on uh, the Basel Committee uh, literature. On January 21st, 2021, 30-year fixed rate mortgages had an interest rate of 2.77%. Now, for the same loans, individuals are looking at a 6.69% interest rate for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. For the median home valued at $436,800, the difference from less than two and a half years ago to now equates to over $300,000 more over the course of the loan. For the median household making around $71,000 a year, that extra $10,000 a year out of pocket and mortgage costs is crushing. Some areas like my district are even harder hit due to the high cost of living and the lack of housing. Combine that with inflation at or above 4%, and these factors are taking a real toll 
on the average American family, including in the Hudson Valley. Now, further decreasing the availability of credit to households and businesses across the country would only likely, likely worsen this uh, crisis. So, Chairman, do you agree that excessively high capital levels constrain banks' lending capacity with spillover effects on jobs and living standards for Americans, and effects would begin immediately, independent of any proposed phase in timing? I do think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a trade-off between safety and soundness and uh, availability of capital, and you want to get that balance right. That's but respectfully, you said you have testified that there was more than enough capital in these banks. So where are, where are we unsafe and unsound that we would require more capital requirements? Well, as, as I mentioned, that's the question we're going to be asking as we review uh, the proposals when they do come forward. They, we don't have a proposal in front of us at this point. And I think any, as I mentioned, any, any increase in the capital for the large banks would need to be justified. I don't know that there will be much in the way of capital increases proposed for banks other than the very large banks, but we'll have to see. So you don't believe regional and community banks will face the same uh, requirements? Very, very different requirements, I would think, as they do now. But you're not, going to, you're not looking to increase the requirements on them? We'll have to see what, what the proposals turn out to be. Honestly, they're, they're still to some extent in motion. And once, once they're out, we can have lots of conversations about the specifics. But until they are, it's, it's tough to do that. And you'll commit to providing this committee with all such analysis before any proposals come out? I, I think there will be a proposal uh, that comes to the board sometime this summer. And the board will, board will vote on that, and we'll obviously share whatever uh, analysis we have. Are you concerned that any significant increase in capital could significantly jeopardize the Fed's efforts to rein in inflation? So the thing about capital requirements is there would be a 90-day a comment period, roughly something like that could be in that range. And then there would be a period, a long period, of considering those uh, the comments that are made, and then there would be movement toward uh, a com coming to an agreement about what to, what to finalize. And after that, so that would take many months. And then you would be into a situation where there would be long phase-ins. So I don't really think capital requirements play into the near-term economic situation the way interest rate hikes do. Chairman, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI inflation calculator, it takes $1.16 today to buy the same consumer goods and services as $1 purchased when President Biden took office in January of 21. Do you agree that outsized inflation we have seen since early 2021 has caused and continues to harm workers, retirees, and families trying to make ends meet and pay their bills? I strongly agree with that, and that's why we are taking the measures we're taking. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Nichols, recognized. All right. Uh, thanks, Chair Powell, for, for, uh, for being here with us today. Um, back in 1995, uh, I, I worked here in Congress as an intern for Dick Gephardt. I, uh, I was in his press office, and we had newspapers, you know, where my job would be to clip out the, the articles and paste them on a, a sheet. Um, but when I was here in 95, uh, the Grateful Dead were playing. It was one of Jerry Garcia's last concerts. And I was just so disappointed that I missed that concert. Um, but was excited to see that, that from public reporting that you were at the, the most recent Dead & Co. Dead & Company show. Um, I've, I've been to this, this version with John Mayer and enjoyed it, but I, you know, we, we, were, we weren't here. How was the show? Did you like it? Oh, it was terrific. What can I say? So, <laughs> it was great. I've, I've been a Grateful Dead fan for 50 years. So. Well, I, I've, I've found one universal truth that people, I like people who like the Grateful Dead. So, so, so having said that, uh, you know, I've got a, I, I have limited time, but do you want any time to, to, to go back to some of the questions that you had? Do you, any, you want to elaborate on anything that you've said here so far today? You're, you're very kind to offer, but uh, I'm, I'm fine with the answers I've given so far, I believe. Well, um, uh, you know, back to that show, you know, a lot of people there in Virginia and like my constituents, you know, they're very concerned about this economy. They're worried about, you know, the cost of groceries, rising inflation, interest rates going up. 
And, and when we do these hearings, you know, it's always big news. The things you say, are, you know, move markets and are very important. But Fed speak is just so hard for my constituents and, and the American people to understand. What, what can you tell, you know, the American people who, who are concerned about the economy in a way that they can really understand where this economy really is heading? <laughs> So I, I guess I would say this economy is very strong, and what's you know what's driving it now is just a very strong labor market. There's still um, significant demand for workers. There are more job openings than there are unemployed people. Wages are moving up, and that's really what's driving the economy forward. People's disposable incomes are are, are coming up. Inflation is moving down gradually. The thing that the thing that troubles people, and I think the thing that accounts for the surveys you see where despite a, you know, a historically strong labor market, people are still concerned about the economy. It's really inflation. So this is our job, is to bring inflation down. The way we do it is by raising interest rates. And while that can be painful, what it does is it, it gradually slows down demand so that supply and demand can get back into alignment and so that we can have inflation running at 2% and people can get on with their lives and basically not have to think about inflation. That's what the definition of price stability from from one standpoint, is just that people can can live their daily lives without without thinking about inflation all the time. We want to get back to that place, and and we're you know we're on a journey to get there. Uh, we just we have a, a, quite a ways to go, but we're making progress. And, and I've always wondered this, you know, and I, I think there's a pretty simple answer. But you know, if Congress was in charge of setting interest rates and it became a political thing, do you, do you think that's something that we could handle as a as a legislative body? I wouldn't want to comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a safe answer. All right. Um, you know, and, and I do want to just join on the chorus with, with a lot of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle here about capital requirements for banks. You know, I brought this issue up with Vice Chair Barr, with Mickey Bowman, you know, and, um, you know, in your, in your written questions for the, the last time you were here, I, I didn't get a chance to, to ask questions because, we, you know, my seniority here on the committee. But you said, um, you answered in writing and you said, we've got to be mindful of the trade-offs associated with adjusting capital levels as it could, quote unquote, cause banks to reduce the availability of credit or to pass higher costs of credit on to consumers, end quote. And you also said that, quote, capital and liquidity levels at our largest, most systemically important banks are at multi-decade highs, end quote. You know, my constituents sent me here to lower costs for working families, so increasing borrowing costs really hits them hard. Uh, as the Fed considers new capital requirements, how do you intend to strike that balance between the, the trade-off that, that, that you, you talked about in your written response? So that is the balance. You, you said it um, very well. So it, stronger capital requirements mean we have, a, we have a stronger banking system, means it's more resilient to downturns and crises and things like that, so banks can continue to lend during even stressful times. And so that's very important, and we put a high value on that. Um, so, and, and yet, of course, we know that at the margin, the cost of the cost of capital goes up for banks, and the cost of credit will go up. So it's it's a balancing thing, and I don't. It's there isn't any one simple model or answer. So you just have to make a judgment call based on that, and that's what we'll be doing as we as these proposals are made and then and then assessed. Thank you. Now you back. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. I look forward to joining you at the next concert with the chairman. We'll see how that works out. Chairman Powell, thank you very much for taking time to be with us here today. Recognize, first of all, that you get, um, I think, politely said feedback from every sector on how you're doing your job. Uh, you are charged with two mandates. Primarily among those are price stability and combating unemployment. As my colleagues have discussed today, the labor market is clearly very tight and you should be credited with succeeding in maximum employment and being a partner in this. Unfortunately, as we've also heard, and as the country is experiencing, we haven't collectively been as lucky in terms of price stability. Core CPI is still over 4%, and services and housing costs remain very sticky. Given the economic uncertainty on how the Fed will bring inflation to its 2% mandate, can you quickly touch on how the bank capital requirements Vice Chair Barr is proposing? And I'll be specific here. Uh, my Main Street businesses, especially farmers, uh, family farms, and uh, Iowans back in my district really provide a backbone on this, and they depend heavily in this area. Do you think that they will be facing a more difficult and expensive credit environment as a result of this? I, I don't think so, and particularly in the near term. So. Uh, 
first of all, many of those people will be dealing with regional and community banks right. rather than with the GSIBs. But uh, even with the GSIBs, though, the, as I mentioned, the, you know, the phase in for higher capital, the process of, of, uh, of publishing and then getting comments and evaluating those comments and, and then coming to a broad agreement and consensus on, on what to implement and over what time period, that takes time. And it, so it, won't, it will not be important during, during this period of the next year or two when where we're getting inflation back down to target and the economy's kind of normalizing. I don't think the capital will, will uh, you know, will, the capital changes will have much of an effect in the near term. So Mr. Chairman, let me ensure that I'm hearing you correctly. And Vice Chair Barr is engaging with small businesses throughout the Midwest right now on potential knock-on effects from this holistic review. Some economic studies have found that these knock-on effects will increase borrowing between 50 and $200 billion. As we look to cut this in half, um, is this the right thing to be doing? Sorry, cut in half. The, the inflation rate. Honestly, I don't think the two are really in conflict. We, we have an obligation to bring inflation back down to 2% over time, and we will do that, and we'll use our tools to do that. Uh, but I think the question of bank capital is, is real. I don't see it as a, as a, as a key factor in, in how we think about inflation, because again, it'll take, it'll take quite a while to decide what to do and then to implement. Uh, some of the changes we're talking about will have multiple year phase-in periods, for So example. Mr. Chair, let me ask you on that implementation timeline, uh, particularly for new capital standards. You said it would be some years before it would go into effect. According to a report published last year by the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, in the case of implementation Basel III, banks began to increase their capital ratios, and I quote, prior to the publication of specific language applicable to U.S. banks, end quote, and that bank responses we estimate to take place well before Basel III rules started to come into force after 2014. Do you agree with the Cleveland Fed, and do you believe that our banks will begin to adjust as soon as the proposal is released? Yes, I do. I, I, it's, it's not an absolute thing where they'll wait until the effective date. Right. They will certainly, and they may even be starting, but, but I would think the project, the earlier you start, the more gradual the path will be. Very quickly, I want to turn to a different subject. It's been brought up by a number of my banks back home uh, relating to a central bank digital currency or any federal issued coin. We have seen how this administration and the last Congress wanted to require anyone who made more than $600 on a third-party settlement organization like an eBay purchase has to report that to the IRS. The existing threshold before the law was modified was $20,000. That is how far this administration wants to peek behind the curtain of what my constituents are spending their money on. And $600 in Iowa doesn't go a long way. It's the equivalent of a PlayStation or paying for your kids' dance classes. I'm a dad of six. <laughs> I digress on this, but I do want to know specifically, for my constituents back home, the thoughts of creating a central bank digital currency that tracks individuals. Uh, if the Fed were to offer a direct individual account to citizens, wouldn't this be a direct threat to the financial privacy of many Americans? Potentially, and that's why we would not, it's not something we support. We, we would not support, you know, accounts at the Federal Reserve by individuals. That would not be. If we were to, and we're a long way from this, if we were to you know, support at some point in the future a CBDC it would be one that were in intermediated through the banking system and not directly at the Fed for exactly the reason you, you point out. I'm very happy to hear that. I think that's a good partnership with the individuals there and a respect for um, Americans across the board. With that, uh, I yield my time and recognize the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. Peterson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Chair Powell, for being with us again today. I, I come from Colorado, I was in the legislature for 10 years, and I, when the pandemic happened, I was part of uh, being one of the um, unfortunately elected people during that time, that difficult time. Um, when I think about what our country was going through a few years ago, where our economy was almost in, in free fall, um, completely shut down our local governments were uh, they were slashing their budgets, they were laying people off, and what that moment meant that we had to do in, in stepping up at the national level to infuse dollars uh, to save our country's economy. So my frustration here is that we continue to talk about inflation as if it was um, spending just, just to spend money, instead of acknowledging the urgent crisis that this country and this world was in and what we needed to do 
in the moment to make sure that we were able to recover, keep our small businesses afloat, our local governments, um, and ultimately recover much quickly, much more quickly than others. So uh, since we talk about this often, I'd like to know if you look to other countries around the world who didn't infuse dollars like we did, uh, is there s countries that we can, can look at to compare what the outcomes would be and, and what is their recovery like now? Our recovery is by far the strongest of, of any country. And, and I would say uh, inflation that we have is actually, everybody's, everybody has very high inflation. The EU, the Bank of, I mean, sorry, the United Kingdom, um, many countries within Europe as well. Thank you. That was my next question is how we compare to other highly developed economies on our recovery. So it sounds like in the emergency that we were in, the hopefully once in a century global pandemic, that the United States ultimately met the moment. And that as when the American people look at what has been done, uh, we should feel really good about where we are. But we know we have a long ways to go. Um, and so I also want to acknowledge that something that comes up often is that rising debt leads to increase in higher rates of inflation. Doesn't that also include tax cuts, trillions of dollars of tax cuts that we couldn't afford that went on, that went on our rising debt? In terms of today's inflation? So I, I think if you look, I mean, to your point, you, you look around the world, there has to, there's a common factor that's, that has driven inflation very high in lots of advanced economies, and it's, it's the pandemic, and it's everything about the pandemic, the closing of the economy, the reopening of the economy, the fiscal support, the monetary support, all the things that happened went into high inflation. And, uh, you know, inflation is coming down. We'll look back on this, and, uh, and we'll be able to look back at very period of very high inflation. But I think it's not just monetary and fiscal policy. It's also just things to do with the pandemic, various shocks. Absolutely. Uh, it's hard to believe where, uh, where we were a few years ago and where we are now, uh, although we do have challenges ahead. Another frustration that I have here is uh, our failed policies around immigration reform and providing legal pathways for workers here in this country. When I talk to business leaders across the country, they say that the number one thing that we could do to address inflation is address legal pathways for people who want to work here. Um, and so, while I recognize you say your job is to address inflation, you are still limited only within the tools that you have. So my question to you is, would an increased labor supply help supply chain issues and inflation in this country? So we're seeing that now very much. Um, a little bit to our surprise, we've seen a bounce back in labor force participation and also a significant return to the prior trend in, infl in uh, immigration. And that we believe, and most analysts would say, that that's part of why employers are finding it, uh, finding the labor market to be a little bit less tight now. It's still, it's still extremely tight, but that, that more labor supply is helping the labor market get back into balance, including through immigration. Great, thank you. Another concern that I have is not just now our inability to address uh, legal pathways to work in the United States and the consequences of not doing that to our economy, I really worry about uh, in the long term if we don't address our labor shortage. Uh, so I'd like to know if, if we are unable to um, provide these pathways looking at the needs of this country, do you see this contributing to the rising costs and inflation here in the United States in the long term? I'm not sure about the long term, but I, I would say that, you know, right now still um, employers are reporting a, a very uh, significant excess of demand for workers over, over the supply of workers. And uh, so there's a lot of demand out there for people to work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies, time has expired. I now recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Dela Cruz, for five minutes. I thank the chairman for holding this important hearing today. It is critical that this committee continue to explore how the Biden administration's ill-conceived policy and regulatory uh, approaches are harming our nation's economy. And thank you, Chair Powell, for appearing before us today. I'd like to lead off with a question that I posed for Vice Chair Barr when he recently appeared before this committee. 
as a representative for a largely rural district where my constituents, of which 86% are Hispanic, um, heavily rely on smaller institutions or community banking institutions for their financial needs. I am concerned about Mr. Barr's focus on factors that aren't necessarily material to the recent bank failures. His report on Silicon Valley Bank seemed to go out of its way to advocate for higher capital levels as a cure for the recent bank failures instead of the failures of regulators and bank mismanagement. In fact, one of your other colleagues, Federal Reserve colleagues, Governor Bowman, echoed these concerns in recent remarks when she said, the unique nature and business models of the banks that recently failed, in my view, do not justify imposing new overly complex regulatory and supervisory expectations on a broad range of banks. If we allow this to occur, we will end up with a system of significantly fewer banks serving significantly fewer customers. Those who will likely bear the burden of this new banking system are those at the lower end of the economic spectrum, both individuals and businesses. Just a couple moments ago, um, Rep. Donalds asked you a couple of questions, and your response was that you mentioned how important community banks are and that you are keeping them in mind with all that you do. As I speak with my local community and um, regional banks, they say that the increase in regulation and in capital requirements will really hurt them. With that being said, what I find as being an outsider in politics, new to the political arena, I find that people here in Washington, people who hold leadership positions are often out of touch. And so I wanna ask you, Chair Powell, do you personally bank with a community bank? I have over time, uh, not currently, but yeah, I, I, my, uh, our, the last mortgage that my family and I had was, was you'll, you would like the story, I can tell you someday, but we had a very large bank which uh, sort of failed at the last minute to, to come through with our mortgage and we went to the local community bank and they knew my family and they knew the house and they were able to give us a mortgage without difficulty within a few days. So I have, I have very positive experience with community banks. So with your relationship with uh, community banks in the past, how do you feel that increasing regulatory burdens would, would have consequences to these community banks? So I, you know, I, I really think that, that the things we're looking at are not about community banks, they're about the, you know, the very largest banks, and to some extent, you know, banks in the Silicon Valley bank range is sort of 100 billion to 250 billion, so that's far larger than I would consider a community bank to be under 50 and probably under 10 billion in assets. So th those are not the focus of the regulatory re reforms, I believe, that are going to be proposed to, to the board for consideration uh, this summer. And uh, I, will, um, I will also hope that that be true because, as I said, in my district, we have a lot of community and regional banks that would suffer with increased regulation and capital, uh, capital requirements. And so with that, I have very little time, so I will yield back to the chair. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, for five minutes. I want to comment on one success story. Several years ago, there were $16 trillion of LIBOR instruments where the amount the debtor was supposed to pay the creditor was to be determined by the London Interbank rate. And as of June of this year, that rate will no longer be published. Something happened unusual here in Washington. A year and a half before the LIBOR hit the fan, Congress acted. You published your regulations in February, and the problem uh, is solved. Um, I want to 
pick up on the ranking member's comment that it's critical that we deal with housing. Uh, there's a lot we can do in Washington, but we also need to get cities to allow the construction of apartment buildings and condos. Uh, someone has, here has talked about uh, the de-dollarization. Uh, uh, we need to compete against the euro and against the yuan, but one place where Congress can act is with regard to crypto. The crypto billionaires have told us they want to displace the dollar. They're working for de-dollarization. And when billionaires tell you they are trying to hurt your country, you should believe them. Um, there's been a, a discussion here as to whether it's the pandemic or Washington, D.C. policy that's caused the inflation. We have a perfect test case. Our annual inflation rate is now at 4%. The European Union, where Mr. Biden is not president and Mr. Powell is not head of their Federal Reserve, um, the European Union is uh, in May had 7.1% inflation. The unemployment rate in the United States is 3.7%. The European Union is at 6%. Um, and since the pandemic began, GDP uh, has grown in the United States 5.3%. In the European Union, only 3.1%. I think it's pretty apparent that our policy has turned out to be actually better than Europe's policy. Um, banks and bank regulators have said, oh, how could we possibly have anticipated uh, the inflation and interest rates of 2023? Well, today we have 4% inflation. That is almost exactly the average inflation rate over the last 50 years much lower than it was in the Reagan administration when we had 13.5% inflation, 16% interest rates. Uh, and that's why I blame the management and also the regulators at Silicon Valley Bank for telling us that, oh, this was an unanticipated um, uh, circumstance. Um, it's certainly one of the things they could have anticipated. Um, I'll point out that both the Congressional Budget Office and the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business's models both show that uh, the estimated effect on, of the Inflation Reduction Act on inflation will be st statistically indistinguishable from zero. So we'll accomplish a lot for the environment and not increase inflation. Of course, the recent action by Republicans to uh, take away IRS enforcement will lead to uh, higher deficits and higher inflation. The chair of the committee tells us we don't need regulation of our well-capitalized banks. Why are they well-capitalized? Because of our regulation. And um, I do want to uh, uh, focus on whether our banks really are well-capitalized. Uh, Mr. Powell, are our banks well-capitalized if you value their assets at today's fair market value, where we have experienced higher interest rates and the value of the debt declines, and are they well capitalized even if you assume that depositors are not just gonna leave their money lying in the banks, but that the, the obligation the bank has to its, uh, to its depositors is valued at full face value, but the marketable securities and loan portfolio is priced at today's interest rates. Under those circumstances, do we have a well-capitalized banking system? Well, I think you have to take the capital requirements as they are I, for purposes of this. Well, question. that's the, and that's the say, problem. Our capital requirements are not, are, are hide the facts that are unpleasant. Right, if you don't hide the facts, are we well-capitalized? Traditionally, though, as you know, traditionally, uh, a rising rate environment has increased the value of the deposit franchise, which more than or at least offsets any any portfolio losses. So we're well capitalized if depositors are, are continue to be lazy and stupid. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Chairman Powell can submit any additional response uh, to, for the record. With that, we recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Okay. Ogles. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Powell, as you know, when the COVID-19 pandemic started, the Federal Reserve began a round of quantitative easing, referred to as QE4. Uh, like many COVID policies, this program dragged on, uh, not ending until March of 2022. 
To conduct this program, the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet with short-term interest-bearing liabilities on one side and long-term interest-bearing assets on the other. And this was at a time of historically low interest rates. When predict predictably, expansionary fiscal and monetary policy sent inflation to the highest level in 40 years, the Fed was forced to raise interest rates rapidly. Now, going back to one of my colleagues' questions about uh, the bank losses and the result of that being poor management and, and failing to hedge against the interest rate environment, is that, is that a fair summation that management uh, and failure to hedge is what ca caused some of the bank losses? Certainly, uh, many banks manage the uh, interest rate risk that came along through that technique. But some did not, is that correct? Some did not. In October, the Fed suspended its remittances to the Treasury due to losses. Uh, Mercatus Center estimates that the lost revenue for the Treasury will, re will result in $760 billion over the next 10 years. And so it does concern me that Treasury is, is blaming banks for mismanagement when yourself had to stop remittances and will suffer losses. Now, when the Fed prepared its semi, uh, and, I, and I said Treasury Fed, but semi-annual monetary policy reports through, through the time of QE4, none of those reports mentioned interest rate risk um, would, would impact the government's finances. So should that have been disclosed, or did the Fed not understand its own risk in, in correlation to the interest rate environment? Well. So what we do, we, we remit all of our profits, right? And right. in the era of Q, QE, those profits were enormous. We remitted something like $1.2 trillion in profits to the, to the Treasury Department because, you know, we're, we're funding purchases of long-term assets with issuance, as you pointed out, of overnight, you know, lower-rate instruments. So, you know, in a, in a, in a way, that, that's what was happening during the QE era. As, as we now enter an era of raising rates, uh, that'll turn around a little bit. But ultimately, though, we don't manage at all for fiscal reasons. We, what we're managing to is maximum employment and price stability, and we're using our tools to achieve that. So we don't, we don't think of ourselves as, as, uh, as trying to attain some kind of fiscal goal one way or the other. But what about as far as, well, well, I guess I'll ask this question. When you look at you know, the <clears throat> roughly $700 billion in blow to the Treasury, what is, how's that going to impact the president and Congress's kind of economic plans and policies going forward? I mean, is it going to impact negatively? It, it, it's not, it, it doesn't affect spending, right? It doesn't affect, Congress appropriates money, the executive branch spends it. Um, it affects, it, it, so it, it will mean that more borrowing has to take place and that could raise rates very marginally at the margin. Uh, but that, that's how it would affect the budget, but it wouldn't be a major effect on the budget. Well, I didn't ask about the budget, moreover, than our over, overall economic goals. And I think what, what I think a lot of us are getting at is when you look at Main Street America, when you look at uh, mortgage rates and how it's impacting, you know, you know families' abilities to, to get a mortgage. And so someone who was eligible for $300,000 to buy a home now is no longer eligible for that home. You have people that are now upside down due to due this, you know, expansionary uh, you know, interest rate environment, and and I and I have concerns about uh, you know future raises and the impact that's going to have on small businesses, availability of credit, and again, your average homeowner and the people that pay that or bear the burden of that are your lower income and your middle class families. Um, now, when you look at Silicon Valley Bank, and which is supervised by the Fed, um, what what again? I get back to the when you look at the ex the interest rate increases, why there was not more warning or hedging uh, from you as, as the impact it may have on the fiscal system, the financial system, and the banking system, because as, as we, we well acknowledge both sides of the aisle that there was some poor management, but the regula regulators and the communication from the government was lacking. And Mr. Chairman, I am out of time. Mr. Powell, thank you for being here, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ruggles. With that, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank the ranking member. Uh, welcome, uh, Chairman Powell. Good to see you again. Uh, Chairman Powell, I, I heard some of your comments the last couple of days uh, about 
the Fed's seeking a softening in the labor market. And uh, as, as a former union president for the iron workers, I always took a, a, a dim view of a softening uh, of, of the labor market because it, you know, reduced bargaining power and that sort of thing. But I do admit that right now, unemployment rates are historically low all across the country. I think Massachusetts, the Fed numbers are 2.8% unemployment. Uh, Arkansas, even less. Alabama, even less. <clears throat> so uh, I, I understand the need for your, for your position. Uh, but when you look at the black and Latino unemployment rates, in some of these major cities, they're, they're double that. And I can't help but seeing this as an opportunity uh, to, to perhaps redouble our efforts to pull workers who want traditionally have strong connections to the job market and, and, and make things happen. Uh, at the federal level, we, we fund about 25,000 job training programs. And according to the GAO, we don't do a very good job. I think the average program produces about three workers per year. But I am aware of the work that uh, the Fed is, the Boston, the Boston Fed is doing with the Gateway Cities program. Susan Collins is running that uh, in the Boston area. And, and the Fed actually helps us with data and coordination. Uh, and cities like Brockton, Massachusetts, my district, but also Fitchburg and other more rural uh, areas, uh, the Fed comes in and, and actually provides a great amount of expertise and has done wonderful, wonderful work. And I'm just wondering, are there, are there other tools in our toolbox that the Fed could use to, to help? You could soften the labor market by adding workers as well. And, and uh, I'd rather see that on the supply side than simply restrict credit and uh, and squeeze companies into a position where they have to lay people off. Uh, and I'm just wondering if there are other tools that you think might be available to us to accomplish that. So I'll say um, two things. First, what the softening that we've seen so far in the labor market has been around uh, job openings declining. It has not been around unemployment increasing. It's seen, we've seen some wages moderating back toward more sustainable levels. You, you'll remember well the labor market before the pandemic, yeah. where we had 2% inflation and really t a really, really tight labor market with no inflation, and a lot of the gains were going to people at the lower end. That, that's where we all want to get back to, because what we have now <clears throat> is a very tight labor market, but inflation is so high, it's eating up the wage gains that these people make, so we, we need to get away from that. In terms of, uh, of other tools, um, I, I, I visited uh, East Hartford, which was another one of those cities, and I agree with you. We, we're not spending taxpayer money on this. We don't have the authority to do it. We convene right. people who have private sector funds, and we focus on a, um, on a city, and I, I was really uh, impressed. I don't know if you've, you sound like you've visited one or more of these cities. It's, yeah. it's amazing what you can do. Yeah. And, and, but as a convener, really, rather than as uh, you know, a, a, an, an agency that has the authority to you know, spend money on people. But so, I, I mean, we, we, do, we do think about these things. We think that the, the most important thing we need to do for working people is to get inflation back to under, under control because it is people at the lower end of the income spectrum who suffer most immediately and worst from high inflation. Yeah, I, I just think there are deeper yeah. structural problems in uh, the limitations <clears throat> within our workforce. You know, I met uh, yesterday with uh, IBEW Local 103 in Boston and uh, you know, I talked to uh, new electrician apprentices, uh, mostly women of color, who they're working days, their husbands are working nights, and it, <clears throat> and it reflects in that, that very, very low unemployment number, which is, I mean, you're getting around 2%. It's, it's really people who are in between jobs. That's, those are the people that are, so there's no real reservoir of, of unemployed workers there that you can rely on. And uh, I, I do appreciate the way the Fed came in and, and the Boston Fed came in and big-footed uh, the situation in Fitchburg where they brought a bunch of people together and they accomplished a lot without spending uh, federal taxpayer money. So uh, I'm going to continue to try to find ways that we could use the, uh, the resources that you have available. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Loudermilk. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Powell, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for being back here. I want to continue a dialogue that you and I had about FedNow. Um, and I also want to continue voicing my concern that this product is a solution to a problem that the private sector is already uh, addressing. The R RTP network is already capable of instant settlement with, much, with a much greater degree of connectivity than FedNow will have at launch next month or in years to come. And my concern is also that the Fed has an undeniable advantage over the private sector in the payment space as it can clear transactions through Fed master accounts. Furthermore, the Fed already has options to improve transaction speeds through existing services. For example, the Fed has discussed extending the operation hours for the National uh, Settlement Security uh, or S National Settlement Service since 2015. So, first question is why not respond to industry demand by improving existing services instead of launching a new one that can compete with private industry? Well, we, um, as you may remember, <clears throat> we surveyed all of the banks, not just the large banks who 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 stood up RTP, which was a very positive development that we supported. And overwhelmingly, the smaller banks wanted us to, to, to set up FedNow. This was a very uh, overwhelming view among smaller banks. They wanted a Fed alternative to RTP. <clears throat> so we set it up. And um, we, we I, I would agree with you. We, there's, that does not a reason not to work on the efficiency of our, of our other payment services. And I hope we're doing that. I mean, I, I know we're doing that. So we, we had also discussed uh, in the past about setting up some guardrails to protect customers from accidental or fraudulent transactions. Um, and we know that's a big issue um, across the entire financial services sector. And in response to that, you know that the banks already have procedures for customers to report unintentional transactions. And uh, FedNow will come up with a suite of features as well to help institutions investigate and remedy any un unintentional or fraudulent transactions. However, with real-time settlements, this becomes a whole lot more difficult um, than just debiting the account that received funds by mistake. Can you elaborate on how, how you're going to handle this protection? Yes, and in, of course, RTP faces the exact same issues. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a problem with uh, real-time mm -hmm. payments. You just have to have very high, extra high levels of security around the payments, who the payee is, and that sort of thing. And, and we do think we can, we can master that and build that in, as, again, as any, as any uh, faster payment. Uh, in, do you have any us. ideas of the direction that you're, you're looking to go? How are you going to be able to, to resolve those? Or is this just something you're beginning to look into? No, I think we've, we've built very strong safeguards in. I, I can't give you the technology answer. Okay. We'll be happy to supply that. Yeah, if you could, if you could supply that, I appreciate <laughs> it. Just a couple other questions. Um, will the Federal Reserve itself use FedNow for real-time payments between banks and in the system? Well, I'm sorry, will it? Are you going to use the, uh, the FedNow for real-time payments between banks within the system? Yes, I mean that's what it's for. It's supposed right. it's an interbank payment system that, that that allows banks to offer real time payments to their customers. Okay, so with that, let me I'm going to diverge just a little bit. Um, I've dealt with in the past at state level with government competing with private industry, and we, we run into this problem where the government has an undeniable advantage. In this case, it had to deal with internet services, uh, where city governments had gotten involved in internet servicing. Um, and started uh, competing against private providers. And the issue came that the, the city governments were undercutting the private providers because of the poll access fee. So we passed legislation in the state of Georgia that required that any municipal government that provides a service that competes with, uh, with private industry has to assess themselves the same fees. So with that in mind, um, Will transactions between Federal Reserve banks be subject to the same rules and fees as other banks? Are you going to charge yourself the same fees that the private industry and, and abide by the same rules as the private industry? I, I don't know the answer to that. I will say um, I wouldn't advocate. Uh, in the payment space, there are many, many instances of a government-operated payment system operating <clears throat> side by side with, with a private sector one. It was not something I would advocate broadly for in the economy. You think about ACH, you think about the about Fedwire, 
you know, there are private sector and, and public sector payment uh, utilities operating next to each other in the United States and around the world. Okay. Thank you. My time's expired. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. I want to thank the ranking member, too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've always had great confidence in you. I told you that personally. Now that you're a deadhead, though, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> Especially after 50 years. Um, but anyway, again, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate the service you've done for our, to our nation. Um, one of my colleagues was talking about the difference in inflation rates in the United States and Europe, um, on both sides, actually. Uh, one of my colleagues on our side talked about that. And I was wondering if you saw the headline today in the New York Times about the UK inflation rate. And you saw that they're running, I think, at eight something percent. Yes, I did see that. Yeah. And um, you were asked a question by a gentleman on the other side of the aisle that when the Biden administration took over, what you could buy for a dollar now cost a dollar sixteen, and that that was hurting consumers. And you said, and I want to quote you, I strongly agree. But the question obviously inferred that inflation was the fault of the Biden administration. I mean, that, that's the whole point of the that question. That wasn't the question I answered, by the way. I would, that's right. <laughs> and I was going to, to say that, I'll give you an and I'll give you an opportunity to answer that, because you later said that the pandemic was the issue all around the world. So is the Biden administration the cause of all this inflation? So the, just to be clear, the question I answered was, is, is inflation hurting people? It was nothing to do with the cause of the inflation. And it, uh, but it's say, inferred, uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. when you say that um, you know, this has happened during the time of the Biden administration, I think the question clearly infers that. I was really, I think you understand the question I was really answering. So I, I guess I would say again, you know, we're, people are going to be unpacking the causes of this inflation. Many, many academic careers will be built on uh, new ways to look at this. Former Chairman Bernanke delivered a paper with a colleague uh, just a couple of weeks ago at Brookings on this. You know, and I just think you see inflation everywhere in the world. There's a common factor here, which has to do with the pandemic. There's also a room for fiscal policy. There's a room for monetary policy in the explanation. And, and I, I just think it's very hard to unpack that. And I wouldn't, I, I, it's not up to us to make a judgment about, we, we don't render judgment on, on fiscal policy. We, we don't support it. We don't criticize it. We, we take it as, as something that, that arrives at our front door. No matter who is president, no matter what fiscal policy is, it's not something we play a role in commenting on right. or criticizing or praising. I wanted to give you an opportunity. I, I appreciate the answer. I wanted to give you an opportunity just to make sure if there was any confusion about that. The confusion was Thank cleared you. up, and I think you've cleared it up. Now, I want to answer a question that you didn't answer, that you passed on. The question was um, if Congress should be in charge of setting the federal mm -hmm. rates fund. Uh, I can't think of a worse idea. The only worse idea, I think, would, might be uh, another idea that was set forward uh, earlier, that maybe we should be involved in supervising the banks, Congress. We can't even figure out appliances here, for God's sakes. We closed down the government over appliances. We can't even figure that out. I don't know how in the world we'd be setting rates and how in the world we'd be supervising banks. Um, Again, I, I think you guys can do a tighter job of supervising banks. I mean, I, I do think that there, and you guys have admitted to that with the Silicon Valley Bank, and, and I hope you do, and I know you're looking at these regulations. Um, it was brought up that since 2008, 2009, their capital requirements have gone up and the banks generally have done well in the stress test. What was the law that caused the rates, the capital requirements to go up? It was a combination of Dodd-Frank and also the Basel Committee. Of course. Agreements. And those are the two things that have, I've heard from colleagues on the other side. They just keep beating up. Now they don't do it as much. But when I first got here, that was now that's the C, CFPB. But that was the, that was the um, choir, again, once again, just saying it's the, you know, the terrible banking. But the reality is it probably saved banking in, in the United States, and I appreciate it. Lastly, I would just comment this. And, and you don't have to comment. I'm just going to make this comment. Obviously. Your focus is narrow, it is narrow and should be. But the notion of climate change is important. I do think that it's affecting the economy. I do think that it's affecting our world. And I do think that we've had our head in the sand for way too long on this issue. And we have to do something about it. Obviously, that's not your mandate. 
But it, obviously, it's important. I hope we do something about it. We don't have the courage to do that in Congress. And that's why I think others are doing it for us. But we have to do something. We see the bigger hurricanes. We see these things happening. And it's because of our participation in making it happen. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, time's expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Chairman, it's good to see you as always. You as well. Many of my colleagues today, of course, have expressed their concerns about the upcoming Boswell III revisions, and I hope you'll continue this dialogue with the committee once the joint rule is proposed and open for public comment. I'd like to follow up with a topic we discussed back in March. I'm sure you're keenly aware of how important it is for banks and companies to manage interest rate risk. Participating uh, during the last several years, the Silicon Valley Bank made that very clear. Uh, could you speak generally to how hedging interest rate risk is an important risk management tool for U.S. banks and companies? Well, I think you see the reality of it here. When, when rates go up, um, banks are encouraged by their supervisors and, and their own internal personnel and risk committees uh, that uh, they need to manage that risk. And most U.S. banks did, did a good, good or adequate job of that, I would say. But it's, very, it's a fundamental risk of banking. The most, exactly. One of the most ba basic risks, along with credit risk. Exactly. <clears throat> and on that point, I've heard concerns that the Fed's Basel III revisions could increase costs for derivatives in users, whether hedging interest rate risk or commodity price risk. I'm optimistic that these concerns will be addressed. Having said that, these revisions to capital requirements do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, the SEC is proposing major changes of their own. Last week, I asked Secretary Yellen if Treasury is coordinating with the Fed and SEC on economic analysis is necessary for, to understand the potential consequences of U.S. banks implementing both significant market structure changes and increased capital requirements associated with market activities. The Secretary responded that uh, the Fed is, in fact, coordinating with Treasury on this analysis. Are you aware of this coordination, and have you personally been a part of these conversations? I have not been a part of those conversations, uh, but I do understand that that's correct. Okay. Chairman Powell, I'd like to follow up with you on your conversation with Congressman Gonzalez from earlier today. You have assured this committee that the Fed is not a climate policymaker, and I appreciate your commitment to this. However, I'm concerned that the Fed's regulatory toolkit would be utilized in a way that would, in effect, require the Federal Reserve to make policy decisions on climate change. We've seen other U.S. financial regulators embark on significant climate rulemaking, such as the SEC. And Chairman Powell, are there principles you keep in mind when ensuring that the Fed doesn't <clears throat> give in to, shall we say, political pressure around things like climate change? There are, and uh, for starter, one would be that we, we don't see it as at all appropriate for us to tell banks what legal businesses they can lend to. <clears throat> That's not our role. We don't allocate credit. So what we do is we supervise banks to make sure that they understand and can manage the risks that they're running. And we're, we're thinking of, of that as our point of contact with climate change in the sense that <clears throat> it's another risk that over time banks need to be able to analyze and assess. So, but fundamentally though, the, I, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, climate change is gonna be a very important issue for a long time and it, and it needs to be addressed principally by, <clears throat> by elected people because it has, it has enormous distributive uh, consequences and, and, <clears throat> and we don't have a mandate to, to deal directly with climate change as a policymaker. It does arise in connection with bank supervision, but that's not the heart of bank supervision, that's just a small part. I very much appreciate those comments, Chairman. On another topic, I'd like to discuss the Fed's balance sheet, which currently stands at around eight and a half trillion. As you know, the size of the balance sheet uh, more than doubled as the Fed worked diligently to stabilize markets during the height of the pandemic. Now, as the Fed begins to reduce the balance sheet, could you explain this process and describe the levels of securities that the Fed would look to maintain in the long term? So the way the process works is securities mature. And, um, and they roll off our balance sheet. And that, that's the way it works. And there, there's a cap uh, in among for MBA, mortgage-backed securities and also for treasuries, so it doesn't get too large. 
And if you hit that cap month upon month, you'll, it works out to roughly a little less than a trillion dollars a year in shrinkage, which is a whole lot faster than, than the, what we did uh, in the last cycle. But then again, the balance sheet is that much bigger. In terms of the level, we're thinking about uh, um, a, a level that, is, that will allow us to operate our abundant reserves regime um, with, with, a, with enough of a, of a buffer on top of it so that reserves won't accidentally become scarce. I can follow up more with you on this. Thank you. My time has expired, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Beatty, is now recognized, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Chair Powell, for being here today. I have two questions I'm going to try to quickly uh, get through. The first question on the U.S. dollar dominance is kind of a follow-up to Congressman Torres' question. Uh, Chair Powell, in the National Security Subcommittee, which I'm the ranking of, we've been discussing the importance of preserving the U.S. dollar's status as a global reserve country. Can you share with us the current status of dollar dominance as it stands today and whether there are risks uh, are to the strength of the U.S. dollar in the international financial system? And if so, what are, what are some of the risks? So the, the U.S. dollar is still the dominant reserve currency um, in the world, and um, that is principally thought to be as a result of our you know, liquid capital markets, the rule of law, strong democratic institutions, uh, price stability over the years, op critically open, uh, money can come in and out of the United States uh, with, without all sorts of legal restrictions and things like that. All of those things are necessary to, be, to provide the world's reserve currency. We have them. There's not another economy that does have all of those features. So as long as we are a country of rule of law and relative price stability and strong democratic institutions and open, open capital accounts, we'll, we, can, we can continue to be the world's reserve currency. History okay. shows that this is not a permanent uh, status, status, but it is a lasting one. And I think in the case of the United States, you know, the, if, as long as we maintain those characteristics of our, of our government and our country, then we'll, we can continue to be the world's reserve currency. Okay, thank you. L let me go to another question that um, will not be foreign to you. You know, as the former chair of diversity and inclusion, uh, I asked you and others of your colleagues, and let me just say for the record, Madam Chair, that Chair Powell was always on point, went out of his way, in my opinion, to make sure that there was fairness and equity for all people. Uh, in light of that, I'd like to follow up with Congresswoman Waters' uh, com um, comments and, and maybe uh, Congresswoman Velasquez, maybe what she was talking about. Uh, several of our colleagues here in, in the Senate, um, your, the person who preceded you, had been, it had been stated by many of us that we thought um, through banking deregulations, he was enabling risk uh, banking practices and failing to combat lending discrimination, which for some thought it might have perpetuated racial inequities. A few weeks ago, Chairman Powell, on June the 7th, to quote, you said that we understand at the feds that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. And everything we do at the Fed is in the service to our public mission. Uh, so could you maybe elaborate, or the time ran out with Congresswoman Waters on, is there anything you'd like to share with us that you do at the Feds uh, that would dispel that there are um, things that you're not looking at that causes one or members of Congress to think that it is perpetuating uh, racial inequities? Well, um, as, as you know, uh, we, we do consider, um, we, we call out uh, disparate economic uh, characteristics of different demographic uh, groups, including by race, and we want that fact, those facts to remain present in, in the room as we're making our decisions. We try to think of maximum employment as a, we do think of it as a broad and inclusive goal, meaning we're not just looking at the aggregate uh, level. I think it's important to keep those facts in your head as you think about monetary policy. 
I will say, though, that, you know, we only, we have one federal funds rate, and uh, we don't really have tools that address distribution and historical inequities and things like that. We Really, the Fed is not an agency that has those things. The best thing we can do for everybody, including in particular low and moderate income communities, is to maintain price stability in a very, very, over a long period of time, and, and on top of that, a very, very strong labor market. Those strong labor market conditions are the single biggest contribution we can make on, on this area. Uh, thank you, and let me end by saying I appreciate your comments that you said you realize that high inflation imposes hardships as it erodes purchasing powers for food and housing from the least of us. Thank you so much for being sensitive to everyone. Gentlelady's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chair Powell. Good to uh, see you again. Um, I wanted to follow up on an exchange that we had had uh, back in, in March, this past March, where we were discussing the parameters highlighted in the Federal Reserve Board's legal opinions that outlined how asset managers can operate without being deemed, quote, in control uh, of a regular bank or a bank holding company. Uh, letters from the Fed's legal division also include certain comment, uh, commitments sorry, made by these asset managers to ensure the same result. Uh, however, it's no secret that this uh, percentage of ownership held by asset managers will constantly fluctuate as shares are purchased and sold on a, on a daily basis. With the ever-changing ownership structure, someone must ensure asset managers are complying with not only these opinion letters, your opinion letters, prepared by your own staff, but also with the statutory and regulatory framework that the letters outline. So, Chair Powell, I'd like to ask you again, uh, is the Fed taking any steps to assess or monitor whether Vanguard, BlackRock, and others are complying with these commitments made in November of 2019 and December of 2020, respectively? Is that ongoing? Can you give me one second? Okay. Sorry, that's a very specific question. I, did, I, I uh, didn't know the answer, but so I, I would say this: we're, we're broadly monitoring the situation. I don't know that we're, we have a particular focus on the on the uh, asset managers. Okay. Well, th those are those were opinion letters put out yeah. by your folks, <laughs> outlining very specific things that could or could not happen. And back in in March, when I brought this up, and now again today, uh, I'm looking to find out who's actually minding the store on that. And, uh, and that, so it's a, it's a little concerning uh, that, uh, that we don't have an answer on that. Um, I, I guess we'll, we'll continue this conversation and, and, I, and I, maybe you can answer this. What division at the Fed is responsible for reviewing and monitoring an asset manager's compliance with these opinion letters issued by uh, the board's legal division? So it, it would be the general counsel's office. We, we don't have any reason to think that they're not in compliance, by the way. But nobody's checking. Well, we'll check, but okay. I think we know what we're going to find. <laughs> I'd like to know what you're going to find, not what you think you're going to find uh, on that. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we'll, I'll be following up with a letter uh, to include some more detailed uh, questions on the, uh, on the topic, and uh, I assume you will commit to getting us a timely answer into that. I think we offered your staff a briefing on this, by the way. Uh, yes, and there was a, there was a briefing, uh, and I, let me be clear. Appreciate the cooperation that uh, has has happened. Uh, we've also had some other briefings. There's been a number of briefings that we've requested, uh, and and frankly, your uh, your uh, division of government has been uh, more helpful than others, shall we say? So uh, I'm going to quickly pivot to a committee's investigation of the SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank failure. Uh, your staff has been working uh, to get us some answers on our outstanding questions. Um, you did your own report, now it's our turn, and uh, can you appreciate that the committee, our committee is conducting its own independent review of what happened in March? Yeah, very much so. Okay, thank you. Uh, will you commit to producing the interview notes and allow us access to the staff who participated in the interviews conducted for the Fed's own internal review of the bank supervision report? I, I'm not in the middle of that discussion. I, I don't know where that stands, so I, I don't want to make commitments that I can't back up, so I'll be happy to, uh, to understand where that discussion is and, and okay. try to work with you. 
Uh, we're going to be following up for sure on that. Um, uh, when Vice Chair Barr concluded that a, quote, culture shift, his words, happened, do you know if the Fed officials spoke with examiners of other banks, or was this conclusion made solely after the review of SVB? In other words, did they find some systemic problem throughout the Fed? I would, I have a, the thing is, I, I didn't play any role by design in the preparation of the report, and I'm reluctant. To, I, I think I know the answer, but I don't want to guess, you know, so I, I, we can give you a 100% clear answer on that, but okay. I'd rather not speculate. Um, all right. Well, along with the FDIC and Department of Treasury, you invoked the systemic res risk exemption, the SRE, for both Silicon Valley and Signature Bank, guaranteeing all depositors would be made whole. For example, regulators could have used orderly liquidation authority, a very tool Dodd-Frank was intended to resolve the, quote, too big to fail uh, institutions while protecting taxpayers. Uh, why was the decision to use SRE made, and do you think that is uh, that we've now lowered the bar to use SRE in future bank failures? I, I hope we don't have to face that question again. We all do. As long as I live. But, but a, um, a new, uh, has a new bar been set? Uh, I would no say pun this. intended. So it, it had, it, 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 this, this happened with no warning on a, uh, in the middle of the night, Thursday night, and you know, less than 12 hours later, we're on the phone with the FDIC, and they're, they're deciding to close the institution and to haircut uninsured depositors. So it was, it was an emergency situation over that weekend. We could see that there was an electronic run building up and we, we did what we had to do to address that and I think successfully. Gentlemen, time, time has expired. expired. Uh, chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Powell for appearing. Now, wars have historically been associated with elevated levels of inflation worldwide, <clears throat> although the relationship is complicated and wars can have impacts on both supply and demand. Higher inflation may just be one of the many prices that the humanity pays for the decision to go to war. Now, we don't have boots on the ground, but there's no doubt that in terms of supply disruption and military spending, both Europe and the US are effectively at war in support of the freedom of the people of Ukraine. So my question is, um, is the 2% inflation target a realistic and appropriate goal during a time when much of the world is effectively at war? Or should the 2% goal be thought of as a goal for normal times, with policies being put in place that will return to 2% when the war is over, and, and, or at least when we've decoupled adequately from the Russian economy? 2% is our goal, and it will remain our goal. Uh, it's a medium-term goal, so uh, you know we, we're using our tools to get the infla inflation level back down to 2%. We're not considering changing it because of the war in Ukraine, and I, I don't know that that's playing a particularly important role in inflation today, although when, when energy prices and commodity prices went up at the beginning of the war, it certainly was. Yeah, well, and, and certainly it's an important factor for Europe still. Yes. The, the disruption particularly. Well, just more generally, you have been trying to deal with this question of how you balance the, your dual mandate. And so whenever you're trying to optimize simultaneously two different things, the first step is to put them into common units. Uh, and so just to be specific here, um, let's say that you're missing your, your unemployment goal by 1% and you're missing your inflation goal by 1% in the opposite direction. You know, at, at some point, uh, do, do those two cancel? Is 1% in one goal equivalent to 1% in the other, or is it, do you need a 2% uh, missing of, of the unemployment target? Um, how, how does you, you know, what are the, I guess this must be implicitly, there must be that coefficient there in the Taylor rule and things like this that try to predict your behavior. But what, internally, how do you view the difference between a 1% um, unemployment missing of the target versus a 1%? So of inflation. The Taylor, Taylor rule is a pretty good place to start there. Same coefficient on, on both variables. Now, is that really true? I, I don't know. I'd have to go look at it. In the original Taylor rule. Okay. But, um, because it, it's, not an, it's a coincidence if the coefficient is one. Because you could choose a quarterly inflation target or an annual or a decadal inflation target numerically and get very different numbers. So it's, it's also, there, there's a um, significant amount of research about you know, the uh, relative social costs of inflation and unemployment, and you, you wouldn't want to ignore that research either. So I, I, I think um, 
there, there'll be a lot of judgment in this. At, you know, at the current moment, it's not a question because we're obviously the labor market could, is extraordinarily strong, and we're very far from our, our inflation targets. So we yeah, don't but have well, you're getting conflict. complaints from business that the labor market may be too tight. You know, there yeah. at least it's viewed from the Taylor Rule point of view that there is a penalty that you pay when the unemployment gets too small. There is a target you're trying to hit. But both okay. sides, and, and both sides both are sides, calling for, right. for tight policy, though. Um, um, yes, that is great at present. But there, you know, you can certainly foresee times when they will be in tension, and they yeah. historically have been. And so you're, you're saying that pretty much it's a 1% on both. That you take, I think you that's take a the, starting place. I, I, I think it doesn't lend itself to, uh, to that level of precision. Yeah, well, it's either that or you have to face questions like you've been facing for the last decade. <laughs> and, and just how do you balance this? I, yeah. um, let's see, in, in terms of the um, internet or electronic runs on banks, it seems like that's a new thing that's going to have to inform um, inform bank capital and liquidity uh, providers. The, the first question is, if you get a significant uh, electronic run on a significant size bank, is there anyone but the Federal Reserve that can provide that emergency assistance? Or do you pretty much have to be the, the only line of defense against the big internet runs? Well, I, I think regulation and supervision can play a role in, in that as well. And Th that's in stopping the run from starting, right? But, yes. if you, but part of that stopping the run from starting is know that, knowing that if it starts that there is someone or some entity that can stop it. We're the lender of last resort. And that's, that is something that only the central bank can be or do. But I wouldn't, I would say changes to regulation to assure that there's, that you don't have this mismatch between runnable liabilities and, and available cash to fund their run-in. That's, that's something we can address and will address through regulation and supervision. Thank you. Yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. And the chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for questioning. Uh, ch welcome, Chairman Powell. Uh, I'm going to start opening, asking about the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee's latest forecast. It predicted that core inflation will fall below 3% within a year. This forecast has been the exact same for each Fed meeting over the past two years and has been wrong each and every time. Why do FOMC participants continue to make the same forecast, sir, and what data are they reviewing to make this forecast? So in, in the world of economic forecasting, we don't really have any advantage over private sector forecasters um, who, who've been at this. There's a number of private sector forecasters that are well-resourced, and ha the data are all public. We don't have private data. That's not how this works. And I think essentially all forecasters have made the same mistake, which is at the beginning thinking that the, you know, that the, the supply chain problems would be resolved quickly and workers would come back to work quickly and things like that. It's just been, uh, inflation has consistently surprised us and essentially all other forecasters by being more persistent than, than expected. And I think we've come to expect that. And, expected to be more persistent. And it just seems that we've moved way past the whole transitory thing, and for two full years now, they've been saying it's going to be under 3%, and clearly they've, they've, they've missed that. So I, it was just, it was just uh, a little it's concerning to me uh, if there was something that we were, were missing. Let, let me move on. Um, in your press conference last week, sir, you stated that, and I quote, the conditions we need to see in place to get inflation down are coming into place. What conditions are you seeing that show that we're moving in the right direction? Because I can tell you, my constituents are still feeling uh, great pain of this uh, inflation that continues to persist. So there's, there's underlying conditions that I'll mention, but the point is you get them in place and then the process of inflation moving down will take a significant amount of time. And, and we've, we've been you know, consistent in saying that. And the conditions I, I mentioned would be First, we, we need economic growth to be slower than, it, to be modest, and it is it has been in, at modest levels, so that's happening. Secondly, we need the supply chain bottlenecks to go away and, and get better and improved. And, and, and thirdly, uh, we need um, the sort of mismatch between demand and supply in the labor market to diminish, and that has been happening. So all, all of those things are happening. 
much later and much more slowly than we would hope. And you know, we, we my committee and I do believe that, it, that the process of bringing inflation down is going to be a relatively lengthy one, longer than we, we expect. Well, it is, it's clear that, that the spending on consumer services, for example, you know, a car oil change, a, a haircut, uh, or a concert ticket, remain almost unresponsive to rate hikes. Do you have a projection for when we might see this spending go down? So uh, non-housing services, the broad service sector is right. famously less responsive to and less focused on uh, rate hikes and, and the cost of capital. So what we think, and that's about half of the, uh, that's about half of core inflation, a little bit more than. So we think, and I think broadly, this is what forecasters think, is that it will take some softening in labor market conditions because in, those ser in that service sector, it's very labor intensive. By far the largest cost for most service companies is labor. So what you, what you want to see is rebalancing so that demand for labor and supply, a lot of that can happen through, through fewer job openings and things like that, and we do see it happening. The Consumer Price Index, or CPI, which measures the price of everything from groceries to cars to rent, has in fact declined uh, from its peak. But this personal consumption expenditures, this is the PCE index, which measures the, as we were talking about, consumer spending, remains historically high. I, I, how else can you account for this difference when it comes to a, a rate hike pause? Well, the, we, we didn't, we, ne we never used the word pause and I wouldn't use it here today. What we did was we, we uh, agreed to maintain the, the rate at that meeting. Um, almost every single of the 16 of the 18 participants on the FOMC wrote down that they, they do believe it'll be appropriate to raise rates and, and a big yes. majority believes raise rates twice this year. And I, you know, I think that's, that's a pretty good guess of what will happen if the economy performs about as expected. Um, yeah, I, I think you're right. More rate hikes likely are needed to bring inflation back down to the 2%. And, um, uh, you know, we're concerned about a hard landing, about recession. So um, anyway, my time has expired. And I now recognize a gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, uh, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Chair Powell, for being here. Um, so in June of 2021 at the Green Swan Conference, um, you quote, you said, uh, climate change poses profound challenges for the global economy and the financial system. In October of 2021, FSOC's report on climate-related financial risk for the first time identified climate change as an emerging threat to U.S. financial stability. And in December of last year, the Fed released climate supervisory principles for large banks that said, quote, the financial impacts that result from the economic impacts of climate change and the transition to a lower carbon economy pose an emerging risk to the safety and soundness of financial institutions and the financial stability of the United States. You've made many comments today that I think are broadly consistent with that in your role, and I appreciate um, the comments you've made in that capacity. Can I, can I safely conclude that, that in June of 2023, six months after that um, release, that the Fed's position is still that climate change presents, presents a risk to the global economy and the financial system? Yes, I mean, I, I, I hasten to add, though, that our role in this is a very is, is a, an important but, but quite small one around, around bank regulation. Uh, understood, and I, I'm not asking for the role, I just want to clarify that. The reason I asked that question is because in, on May 11th, your colleague Christopher Waller at a speech in Spain said, quote, <clears throat> climate change does not pose a serious risk to the safety and soundness of large banks or the financial stability of the United States, and went on to say that the risks posed by climate change are not sufficiently unique or material to merit special treatment relative to others. Should we understand as we sit here that Mr. Waller was speaking in his personal capacity and not as a designee of the Fed, if indeed Fed policy hasn't changed since December 22? So I, I don't comment on what any of the things that my colleagues say. So I, I, I understand, but you understand the concern that if, if, if markets and regulators are to understand that the Fed has a consistent policy, and one of the members of the Fed is saying something that appears to be directly opposed to Fed policy from six months earlier. That's a concern. Yeah, again, it's um, people. We, you know, we governors have always had the ability, and Reserve Bank presidents as well, the ability to have their own views on things, and and that's that's going to happen, and that's probably a good thing that we have a diversity of perspectives. I think there there may be less in that difference than you than you 
suggest, I mean, I, again, I'm, 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 what I'm saying is that banks, we, to the extent we have a role, it is to assure that banks understand and can manage the risks that they do face from, from climate change. Okay. Um, well, I, look, I don't want to create internal tension, but I think we're all aware that you, have, above anyone, is aware that your words are closely scrutinized, and we were concerned with the words of your colleagues there. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like to introduce for the record a, a working paper from the European Central Bank, The Impact of Global Warming on Inflation. Um, I don't know if you saw this report that just came out um, recently, but it says, among other things, that climate change poses risk to price stability by having an upward effect on inflation, um, both food prices and headline inflation. And what I wonder, without opining on their math, if, in fact, we are looking at a world where climate change, per the European Central Bank, is going to increase inflation, and we were to find ourselves in that world going forward, would, would the Fed or other central regulators say, we have tools to address this, or are we going to say, well, that's, that's non-core inflation, what, what are we going to do in hindsight? Because it, it feels to me like we've got a major bank regulator saying climate change uh, uh, is running the risk of inflation, but I don't even know what tool you would use to address that. You know, I can just say for now, this doesn't enter my thinking in any way that we would, in, in the near term, uh, change our uh, inflation goal because of climate change or the need to deal with it. There's a lot of thinking and research that over a long period of time, uh, really the process of, of investing very large amounts of money in a, in a green transition could, could drive inflation up, but that's not something we're thinking about today. We are not, uh, during our FOMC meetings, we are not thinking about climate change as something that's relevant to the current inflation or to current uh, monetary policy, and that sure. is very much our focus today, is inflation today. Yeah, and I guess what I'm struggling with is that if we agree that this is a systemic risk, if we agree that this leads to inflation and we don't really know what role you'd have with tools, there's a concern there. Last thing I just want to end with, in, in April of 23, the report on SVB, um, one of the lessons that was noted in the Fed review said that this is an opportunity for regulators and bank managers to be more willing to adopt a precautionary perspective and that the Fed must strengthen its supervision based on what we've learned. I'm trying to figure out with climate change, if we agree that this is a forward risk, how do we get the Fed the tools to apply a precautionary perspective? The, the gentleman's time has expired. The chairman can submit an answer in writing to the record. <clears throat> and I now recognize myself for five minutes. Chairman Powell, in March, you confirmed to me that the Federal Reserve is a consensus organization uh, built on garnering broad support before agreeing to any proposal. Uh, and given the, um, the breadth and scope of the potential changes to the capital framework, uh, that is under review right now, that consensus-driven uh, approach seems to be all the more important. Uh, I am concerned that the Vice Chairman for Supervision uh, is seemingly, uh, uh, has seeming, seemingly been given far too much latitude to act unilaterally, uh, and especially in light of Section 1107A1 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which uh, provides the Vice Chairman for Supervision authority only to develop recommendations for the Board and oversee supervision and regulation. Can you speak to the process that's underway? Um, is the Vice Chairman acting unilaterally, or is that a wrong characterization? And if so, if it's just a recommendation, can you walk through the steps that the, that the Board will take from recommendation to a vote? Sure. So I, I think uh, what you see is is very much the way the statute works, which is that the vice chair for supervision has the responsibility, the obligation to develop uh, regulatory proposals for for the board that will be considered by the full board. He's, as I mentioned before, in another context, he's not the comptroller of the currency. He he brings proposals to the board, and the board votes by majority vote to support them. Uh, or not, and that's that's how that works. In terms he, of supervision, is he, is he including other members of the board currently? As he's, so I think all of us have been getting briefings on what's developed, but ultimately the job is to present something to the board for consideration by the board. And and how long will that once he presents his recommendations? How long will there be debate, deliberation, and is that transparent for the public? There will be a um, a, a meeting. It could be a virtual meeting. Uh, this summer to vote on these things. In the meantime, there's a lot of conversation going back and forth 
uh, now, and uh, you know we're sort of in the in that process now, but things are still moving around. Our concern.